the bases dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down Here. Welcome back on a Wednesday morning. Uh, look, don't be surprised if Tuesdays become a little more infrequent. Um, as I realized as I went, I don't know how many days in a row with doing games or shows or something else like a World Cup announcement. Um Learn the power of taking days off and how important it is to reset mentally. Uh, golf has been a good way to reset mentally, uh, except when I play as inconsistently as I did yesterday, but that's beside the point. Uh, it was nice to get out and nice to literally take a day off. I did not start the computer after I got home, did not jump into things. Um, got to reset. And it, it, look, it's I think the the world we're in now and maybe I got into this a little bit when I was working in the nonprofit industry and now doing lots of different gigs all over the place. Uh, it's very easy to feel like you have to work 24-7, 365. And that's not healthy as I'm learning. So um, Tuesdays might be our Saturday or Sunday because a lot of times my Saturday or Sunday is a work day. And sometimes both days are a work day or travel day, or something else. So just don't get upset if we take Tuesday mornings off on a more regular basis, because it's important for the mental health. Um, one big anniversary today that I wanted to touch on before we jump into the show in the morning kickoff is it was on this day in 1986 that one of the most memorable World Cup games was ever played, Argentina-England. And if you've seen the Maradona documentary, uh, I wish I could remember off the top of my head who it was who said it, but it's dead on about the, I don't know, the game itself and, and probably one sequence of the game completely encapsulates Diego Maradona's career. Uh, you have the hand of God goal, which should have been a handball. Um, you have VAR, that's, that's a handball, and it's not a goal. But then you have one of the greatest goals you'll ever see, period. Full stop. No way around it. Uh, the goal del siglo, the goal of the century. That's in the same match. <laughs> That's in the same, like, you know, maybe hour of play. It, it's insane that that happened on the same day, in the same place, in the same match. Uh, take those things out. It's still a great match. It's a 2-0 it's a Argentina lead. Uh, England brings on John Barnes. So I have no idea why they didn't start him. And England makes a furious comeback and has opportunities to equalize it and send it to extra time. It's one of the best World Cup quarterfinals of all time. One of the biggest games of all time because you had a lot of undercurrent there with, uh, you know, these countries being at war just a few years before. Uh, wild day at the Estadio Azteca in Mexico City. And if you get a chance today, go back and at least watch the extended highlights. The game's actually available on YouTube. I think FIFA put it up during the pandemic in its entirety, go back and watch it and then go and listen to the Argentine call of Maradona's Gold del Siglo. It'll remind you, I think for, for most of you, it'll remind you why we love this game so much. Um, the passion, the insanity at times, everything about that call from Victor Hugo Morales is, is what we love about the sport. So go back and consume that today. You can do that after you consume a little kickoff coffee. Kickoffcoffeeco.com. Use the soccer down here 15 code. That'll get you 15% off. You also will know that your money going into kickoff coffee, getting your coffee, enjoying your coffee, will also help kids have an opportunity to not just play soccer, but benefit from youth development organizations that use soccer at the heart of it. Fuji's family is one in the metro Atlanta area. Many others worldwide. I, I love that Kickoff Coffee puts the, some of their proceeds to helping kids have better lives through the sport that we all love. So kickoffcoffeeco.com. Soccer down here 15 is your code. Put that in and then know that some of the proceeds are going to help kids out in terms of playing, but also getting those extra life skills, job skills, uh, health skills, all the different things that go into it. So Let's get the show started. We got Dylan Butler and Mike Conti joining us a little bit later, but we've got Jarrett and John ready to go. What's up, y'all? Not a lot. A, a better transition than we were, when we were at the uh, at the stadium the other night. We tried to like slide into the picture. 
<laughs> well, yeah, because I can hit buttons a lot quicker than you two can move. So, you know, just saying. That's true. Just yeah, saying. not an accurate. It's, it's a little bit easier to control. Um, I want to get into some reports that came out yesterday that I had not heard before but are not surprising at all. You've got the Men's World Cup coming up in 2026 with the U.S., with Mexico, with Canada, all partnering up on it. There have been reports about the U.S. going for the next Women's World Cup that will be up for bid. And look, that process has not started yet. Cindy Parlo Cohn has been very clear in saying the U.S. is interested, but there's no bidding process as of yet with FIFA. Well, it came out yesterday that Mexico could be involved in this as well. Uh, Jan de Luisa, the president of the Mexican Federation, said they would present a similar plan. Now, I don't know if Canada would jump on board with this. Why not? They should. To co-host the Women's World Cup. Now, that could be in 27 or that could be in 31. De Luisa said that they would make a bid to host the 27 Women's World Cup. I love this idea. And I would love this idea if FIFA would consider it across the board to have a men's World Cup and then a women's World Cup in the same country the following year. I would love if they would do that just in general. But in this neck of the woods, Jared, it's just a no-brainer with what we've seen with NWSL, what we've seen historically with the U.S. women's national team. And what we're seeing right now in Liga MX Feminil with the growth of the game, the investment in the game the excitement around the major clubs really putting a lot of resources towards the women's game it's a no-brainer and i think it'll obviously be great in this country but i think it could be transformational if mexico's involved yeah i'd be interested to see you know how they how they would split that sort of tournament up because we have the idea of the 26 world cup that it's going to be focused primarily in the united states you know mexico and canada are getting some games but how do you split it up if you have another joint bid for the Women's World Cup? And you know what cities, you know what cities land those big games? Because you know, do you just go to the old standbys? Like I said when we were at the stadium last week, if if and when you do the 2026, whether it's a quarterfinal, semifinal, whatever it might be, a Mercedes-Benz Stadium, that needs to be your launch pad to take it to FIFA and say, look what we can do in this stadium. We we can get the natural grass going we got everything working right put the women's world cup final in this stadium put the women's world cup final in this city there's so many different ways to play it i mean you could easily and you did 99 after 94 you you went to the rose bowl and you had the final there that's where the men's final was in 94 that's easy you've got plenty of venues who are capable of that um you would have the estadio azteca in that kind of a mix if you wanted to go there which would be a, a, a momentous occasion in the game to have a a venue that's had two world cup finals on the men's side to have a women's world cup final. I mean, it it is just one of the cathedrals of of the sport, but John, I mean, you can, you can do some different things with the women's world cup, depending on how you want to. I think what we're, we're seeing though from the women's euros this summer is that while you can maybe use it to get into a few different markets. And I think they'd be smart to do it. They also need to be in the the bigger venues because if you you go into smaller venues and they did not in the ninety nine women's World Cup to be clear and that was a big you know point of, of pushing back and forth between FIFA and U S Soccer's organizing committee because FIFA kind of thought they needed to do that and they didn't and it was the right call but we're seeing that with the women's Euros in in England that they are going into some smaller venues and there's getting they're getting a lot of pushback from that I'd love to see big venues, but maybe a few different cities in the mix if you go for the 27 Women's World Cup. That was the first thought that popped into my head was the cities that we had below the bar when we were looking at 2026 World Cup, those venues that, the, and those cities that didn't make it, it gives them an opportunity with those larger venues, the chance to host on the Women's World Cup side. You get Orlando at Camping World, Cincinnati could have their opportunity at Paul Brown. And that was the first thing literally that popped into my head. Nashville. Exactly. You, you get Nashville at, at Nissan. I'm, I'm trying to go to the higher groups that didn't get it. It doesn't fix DC Baltimore's problem. No, it does, no, it doesn't. But those the, just in that group from 11 to 16 that we were looking at, but yeah, Nashville, they could play some at Geotis if they wanted to in the early rounds. No, and work no, no, that's the whole point. No, no. 
don't play in the soccer specific stadiums. No, not in the early rounds. That's what they're doing in England with the women's euros. And I mean, I think they're going into some even smaller venues and it, no, you don't need to, you no need to go to Nissan or whatever replaces a Nissan, go to the big, big venues. That should be the demand here. It shouldn't be going to the soccer specific stadiums. No, 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 no. That is diminishing the women's world cup. And I think it's a waste of time. Um, you know, Jared, we, we've seen the growth of this. Now, the one thing is different and you mentioned how the term tournament would be formatted. It's a 32-team tournament right now. I don't think there's any plans to go beyond that for the next edition. Now, by the time you get to 31, if they go that route, maybe. But 32 teams, so slightly fewer games, a little bit different format. I think you have to go into the bigger venues, though, or you run the risk of already putting a lower ceiling on an event that needs to be pushed to the bigger ceiling in the first place. Yeah, it's it's a it's a line you got to kind of figure out There's where you want to be. To it, right? There is. Um, you look at the way it was done in Canada with some of the smaller venues that they were able to use, and uh, do you go for more? Uh, do you want to put it in the bigger venue where it might not fill up all the time? Do you go for the smaller uh, venue depending on where you're at? And try and get that intimate, chaotic feel where you know that it's going to be standing room only and everyone is going to just be completely bonkers. You know, how do you figure that out and go city by city? And and it's going to go bid by bid. Um, to your point, yeah, Baltimore, DC's got they got their own things. Yeah, they've um, got their own issues. I mean, to go back to 99 real quick, you, you were yes. in the Rose Bowl, you were in Stanford Stadium, that's 95,000, that's 85,000. You were at what became FedEx, uh, 80 plus thousand. They were at Giant Stadium, 77,000. They were at Soldier Field, 65. They were in Boston at Foxborough, 58,000. They did have Portland, which was not as big. Uh, it was 27 is what's listed here. I think with all the different changes in, in Portland, I don't know what the actual capacity is now. I think it's a little bit less. And you had Spartan Stadium in San Jose, which is too narrow at this point. You couldn't do it. That wouldn't work. Um, so they had two out of eight that were smaller. This was a much smaller tournament, too. I don't think it you is. can go backwards, and I don't think you can you can go to those size stadiums anymore. I, I think you have to be looking at 50,000 plus as the minimum. I think if you do anything else, it sends a, a negative message that you can't fill those venues, um, and you're not even going to try Honestly, for me, as much as anything, it's a matter of I want I want it to not be living just on the West Coast like it did that time. Like, you know, get it on the East Coast because like, yeah, yeah, great. The West Coast exists. Don't put every damn game there like you did last time. Let's start there for me. You got to find some in the that middle because it was really, split. It's annoying as hell. I, I know it, it's I know it's it split. was four and four. It was it was Foxborough. It was Giant Stadium. It was Landover, Maryland. It was Chicago and it was Portland, Stanford, San Jose pasadena so you got to have some in the middle too like yeah dallas wants to go full bore into everything on the men's side okay hey we're asking you let's go kansas let's city. go jerry yes kansas city um denver lots of there there's venues in there again of the right size you can't go the easy move would be to go to to children's mercy to go to yeah. st paul to go to this place i don't think you can do that here and FIFA should not. Will they? Who knows? It's FIFA. Um, I think you need to dream bigger. I think you have to dream bigger, and you have to go into the bigger venues. My only concern with the group stage, the early round stuff, I mean, I am absolutely for having something, at, using Nashville as the example, having something at Nissan or the new $1.8 billion proposed. Two teams that have fan bases that would be traveling a far distance, and I know this is this would be incumbent upon the local bid committee to sit there and drive traffic into to, to fill your venue. Just the the far reaching teams in a group stage in a game where like who? Uh, I was trying to think of uh, you know Nigeria perhaps, and but but it's you're not. But, John, this is the thing about a tournament in the United States. You're not basing the tournament on folks from Nigeria making the trip. You're basing the tournament on Nigerian Americans, second, third, 
further generations making the trip. It's a different conversation, right? It is. Am I, am I wrong in that? No, you're not. Because I mean, you're not you're not expecting that. I mean, are, will you get some of that? Sure, but that's the beauty of a tournament in this country. That's why FIFA wants to be here. It's why 94 sold more tickets than anything else. It's why the 99 Women's World Cup. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'm assuming sold more tickets than anywhere else. Um, it's why you go that route. Now, look, you're going to have to work. Like, sorry, ticket people and organizing committee people. It's not going to be as easy of a sell. If you're in Stanford Stadium or what the new one where they're having the Cali Classico this year, you're there. You get, you know, Argentina on the women's side facing England. You're going to have to work and sell that. That's what you're here to do in this tournament. There is more to the growth of the game in this tournament, in my opinion. And if if I'm FIFA, if I'm looking big picture, what can change the narrative about the potential for this tournament and make me more money when, okay, let's go into the, the FIFA boardroom for a second. I know that's a dangerous place to be. They're going to have to start putting more money being paid out through this tournament. Mm -hmm. The pressure is there. So how do you pay more money out and still make the money they want to make? You bring in more money, right? It's not a rocket science here in that proposal of, of, of how the equation goes. So how do you start to make more money? you make the tournament a bigger deal. And in this country, this is the one that you can do that to where if you go 23 women's world cup in Australia, New Zealand, where there will be some, some great things in that. There will also be some small crowds and some of that, just how it's going to go. You go to 27, you have it here and you have Mexico. And if you have Canada involved, however you split that up, have at it, but you draw an average of 50, 60,000 per game. And you play in the big venues. And maybe you don't sell absolutely every ticket. Maybe every ticket is not 100% full for every single game. Which happens on the Men's World Cup too, by the way. But you have a spectacle across the board. And not just involving the U.S. Women's National Team. That changes how people see this tournament. That's what FIFA has to do with this Women's World Cup. When they bring it here. And they would be really smart, Jared, I think to bring it here in 27 and really go for it. No, I think they would too. I think they would. Um, you do it up big, you know, you, you do it up big Set and you make, it, you make it, yeah. you make it grand. Um, how you want to go about doing that? Um, you know, that's up for debate and different, different people are going to have different ideas, like different stadium organizers are going to have different ideas of how they need to make it grand, you know? So I don't know how you make it happen, but you make it happen, um, for lack of a better, you know, term to use for it. It's just going to be, it's just going to be interesting to see like how you would build, how you would build it, you know, city by city, that kind of thing. You know, I don't know, man. Um, yeah, I mean, these are the things that come up in planning a tournament and, and look, it's not going to be as, as easy. I mean, and this is, I feel like you have to like counter all of this every time we have this conversation. This is not a, a knock. I want to grow the women's game. I want this tournament to be that transformational moment like 99 was because 99 was a transformational moment. You go back to the cultural impact. You go back to the public interest. You go back to showing that you can put a women's sporting event on TV. That's not the Olympics and people will watch. It, it changed everything. You can do that again to another level. That's also understanding a little bit that, it's if you do the 27 women's the women's world cup here it's not going to look just like the 26 men's world cup it's going to be different there are some different scales we're talking about here but this is the kind of event that can bring those scales closer than ever before and it can then set the expectation that hey germany france england italy Whoever goes for the next Women's World Cup, you got to treat it like a big deal. And if you do, you'll be rewarded because it'll be a moneymaker. That's where you have to get the 99 Women's World Cup, uh, second most attended Women's World Cup. The 2015 tournament had a lot more games. So that's why I ended up passing it. You bring a Women's World Cup here in 27, it blows everything out of the water in terms of Women's World Cup 
ticket sales, financial returns, all of it. And to me, it is that perfect opportunity to then get it to a closer level of the Men's World Cup. Now, I think this is your chance because if you go, you know, I don't know, you, you say, I don't know who else has even showed interest so far in, in 27, but say you go to Japan, Korea, or you go to, you know, an, another European country. I don't think it looks anything like 26 does on the men's side. If you come here, it'll look the closest you can possibly get. And if you then, on top of that, have Mexico's opening game in the tournament at the Estadio Azteca and drawing a record crowd for the Mexican women's national team, and you have Canada's opening game in a large venue, maybe pick a a different one that hasn't been used yet, um, on the Canadian side, you have it there. And you draw one of the biggest crowds ever because they did have the 2015 Women's World Cup. It's transformational. And, and I think if you don't take advantage and then you say you come here in 31, John, I don't think it has the same potential if you wait and you have another smaller Women's World Cup and then jump on it. I think it's worth striking while the iron's hot. Absolutely. And it's all we always talk about momentum, whether we're talking about the game itself or what you can do in a corporate sense. And to hop on the momentum that should be created in these three countries that are hosting 26, it is it is a no brainer to attach the Women's World Cup in that next year to the Men's World Cup the previous year. It, it makes entirely too much sense to grow both games in, in the countries that would be hosting, say, 30, 31, 26, 27. It makes too much sense to piggyback in that so you can continue to carry that momentum. Yeah, I, I, I think it's worthwhile. I think it can be a big deal to to have those back to back. Um Jared, where what are some of the other things you'd like to see if the US goes for the twenty seven one, which I think is the better route than thirty one, but the US goes for it, what what are some other opportunities here to to do this women's world cup and do it big time? I want to see what the broadcast rights look like, and that's not something you can just, you know, control all willy nilly. Um do they sell them separate than the men's? Uh, that would be interesting because they haven't. Yeah, done that before. that's 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 kind of what I'm wondering is like, can you can you manipulate how the how the broadcast rights are done? You know, in terms of accessibility, not just um, not just on the sense of you know what's going to be on TV, but like, what can you handle? Can can you make it basically accessible for quick streaming? Can you can you do it in an effective manner? Um, other stuff that's going to be going on around it. We already know the men's world cup will have a bunch of stuff going on. You know, you would imagine you'll have concerts and events and festivals and whatnot. You can do that for the women's side too. You know, how, you know, how big do you do it up for each city? Um, Cause I think if you treat it like the big event that it is, like you treat it like you would a men's side, you'll see that kind of return in terms of, the energy, the people coming through, the money spent, which is going to be a tenth topic. It's going to be a tenth topic about all the World Cups, about you know how much money is spent and how much revenue comes in, and you know what that revenue takes away from and gives to that sort of thing. But you do it up big with the events, you know, before, during, and after, and the atmosphere in each city. I think if you tr- the bigger you treat it, the bigger it is, the bigger it becomes. Yeah, I mean that's the push on the Euro twenty two tournament that's coming up this summer in, in england they're they're playing some games at manchester city's academy stadium at least sports village um you know you're talking about some venues that host 4700 people the academy stadium that sounds disrespectful oh that's the quote about it the 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 response back to that is well we still have tickets to sell and we haven't sold all the tickets yet and we wanted to get the balance right but yes, that's that's the whole point. I just like I feel like it would be disrespectful to have the men's World Cup in the biggest venues and then have women's World Cup in thirty thousand seaters like Geodas. I, I feel like it's it's a different scale, of course, forty seven hundred versus thirty thousand. But I feel like you've got to make it a big deal. Does that mean you might have to work with community groups and give more tickets away that you don't sell to make sure the place is full? Yes, the women's World Cup, absolutely. You should have that stuff on deck and and you want to sell everything and you want to bring in as much money as possible. But if you're able to work with clubs and get kids in the building 
it's worth having it in the bigger building and doing that than having it in a smaller building and making it look small. Could and, be very. It could, ahead, well, my, my last thing before I head out, I know we're we're uh, we're we're tagging out. I'm be interested to see where NWSL is at that point in its history, yep. in its growth, because it could be you know, NWSL has continued to grow. That could be a huge moment for them to say we've already got momentum. Now this is not only do we get a push, we get a push down a hill. Should be. Hopefully they're in a position to take advantage. Uh, they got to get their house in order right now. I, they're making good moves. They still got more to make. Um, but yeah, 27, if the Women's World Cup comes here, it would be absolutely a rocket ship for the NWSL, in my opinion. And Liga MX Feminine, if Mexico's involved in that. And I think that that is maybe, an, and if Canada's involved, maybe it gets them a Women's Professional League, which is a big push. So it could have a huge effect. I think it works best if they, they do it together and they do it right after the Men's World Cup. But we'll see. Jared, we might see you in the second hour of the show, right? You might see me in the second hour of the show. Who knows when you come creeping around? We will. Uh, That's what let the music's for. It is. We'll see you later. See ya. First guest of the day, Dylan Butler, hanging out with us. What's up, Dylan? What's up? How you guys doing? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, we got a lot of things on the MLS front to talk to you about. Uh, stadium updates maybe kind of in your neck of the woods uh, there there seems like there's at least more than we talked last time that feels positive yeah there's more more uh chatter no like official press releases and stuff yes. yet um but it sounds like a temporary home when the yankees close the doors <laughs> is uh, is in the works uh randall's island for for those who don't know it's kind of uh it's kind of between the bronx and and manhattan um it's a really cool spot um i've been out there a bunch they've got a bunch of soccer fields there too um it's an easy bus from manhattan it's an easy ride over the rfk bridge from queens um not sure about the infrastructure in terms of it hosting, say, 15,000 people right. or so. I think there's a lot of work. But um, Icon Stadium uh, is a is a renowned track stadium that's really not used very much other than just the occasional track meet, right? So uh, I think it's an opportunity. You, you've got to make some fixes and adjustments to, to that. Uh, but, yeah, I mean... You know, it's it's not the permanent news I think that fans are looking for, but you know, as as we've heard, uh, even though it's such a great stadium, it's understandable NYCFC fans don't want to go to New Jersey. They don't want to go to Red Bull Arena. Yeah. They're they're tired or they're tired of being shuffled around from this match being moved here and that this this match being moved there. So um this uh sounds like it's a positive step, certainly. There are some increased rumblings, too, about something you talked about. Uh, maybe not the Bronx for a new permanent NYC stadium, but stuff in Queens sounds like it's bubbling up a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I can't take credit for that. <laughs> oh, come on! You started it. But it, it, it just it just makes sense for so many reasons. You know, it's, it's yeah. again, it's, uh, it's the most... I sound like I'm running for Queensboro president, but it's the most diverse borough in the world, in the, in the country, at least. Um, so many ethnicities, uh, it's, it's, it, and, and it's, and soccer is a world game, right? So it's, these kids are, 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 you know, all the things that us soccer talks about or talk, what we talk about in terms of growing the game, like playing pickup soccer on, you know, concrete on in small side, that's happening every day. It's been happening in Queens. So, uh, so yeah, to me, it only, it only makes sense. And also think about it too, from, uh, you know, like, yes, the NYCFC training facilities up in Orangeburg, but their academy set up and the two team play at Belston stadium in Queens. So now if you get a permanent stadium, like it's kind of, you're kind of bringing everything to the same, mm -hmm. to the same area. Yeah, when you mentioned Randall's Island, Randall's Island, uh, I had uh, early New York Cosmos and World yeah, Football right. League flashbacks to the 1970s that was uh, popping into my head initially. And since you kind of addressed how schizophrenic things are seemingly for the NYCFC fan, let me have you put your borough president uh, hat on here. 
Do I have it here? Hang on. All right. Borough President. There we Carolina. go. I like that. Borough President Dylan Butler. And you can <laughs> represent whichever borough you want. Do you yeah, Queens, think. Only Queens. I'm, okay. I'm so, then, so then in your mind, you yeah. think that Queens is the most beneficial landing spot if folks can get their heads screwed on straight to come up with a venue for NYCFC. 100%. I mean, look, it's not going to happen in Manhattan, right? It's just you're not putting anything in Manhattan. It's impossible. Um, Unless it's a floating barge or something. <laughs> That's right. Which could work. Which, I mean, you know, if you think about it, a stadium on a floating barge uh, would be so appropriate for this club, right? Because they've just sort of been floating around in different different venues calling it home. So. I think I did just see a floating barge restaurant that sunk into the sea here recently. So I'd rather not have that on the stadium front. Mm. I, I, uh, could just, I could just see a two hour tour of a floating barge while they're yeah. playing the match, you know, going in and around right. all five boroughs for something like that. Yeah, it should be nice. Um, but yeah, no, I, it's, it's look, you, you, you rule out Manhattan, you rule out Staten Island, uh, which is just sort of too, too far away for, for, most people to go to Brooklyn, similar, um, don't see it happening there. And then it just becomes Bronx and, and, and Queens, right? So it's been in the Bronx, there's been issues. Um, but again, I would say if you pulled it, you probably have more soccer fans. And I'm not saying NYCFC fans or MLS fans, but just soccer right. fans. Yeah. You probably have significantly more soccer fans in Queens. And I think there's the opportunity. Um, you know, I think, I think even. You know, you guys have, you know, you've been to the Bronx. Like, I, I think as crowded as New York City is generally, I, I think, again, in the area by City Field in Queens, there's more opportunity to build. Even by Yankee Stadium, there really isn't, right? Like, right. you've got to get rid of something to put it there, right? Yep. Uh, you've got to get rid of a, a parking garage and, and put it there. Like, what you know what they're talking about? And, and, you, and you can, uh, you've got the space. In, in Queens. There's not a lot of it, mind you. Um, it's one of the reasons I moved out to Long Island. There just isn't room and, and the real estate is crazy, but um, you 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 have that space, you have that opportunity in, in Queens. And again, I think when you throw in the fan, when, when you throw in the, the, the already embedded soccer culture that's there, um, it only makes sense. I mean, you, think about it. You, you have a game out in the city field area the next day or the day before you've got clinics at Flushing Meadow Park where there's already kids. Like you're not having to shuttle kids in to play soccer. They're already there. They're already playing soccer. There's already, you know, uh, empanada carts and, 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 and the music. And it just, it has such a cool vibe. Um, it, again, it only makes sense. We'll have some magic of the cup in your area tonight my, my, with yeah. Red Bulls and, and NYC. We had some last night with Sacramento Republic knocking yeah. the LA galaxy out. How about that? Yeah, I was I was on that uh, match for MLS. So uh, if I if I'm a little bit uh, tired this morning, it's that's the reason. Um, Blame Luis Felipe, right? Yeah, man, former Quake getting it done against uh, against the Galaxy, huh? That was something else. And and I mean, look, uh, I loved what I saw from Sacramento. Right, like they were really impressive. It wasn't it wasn't a smash and grab by right. any by any means. It was. You know, they took their chance early inside the first five minutes. They punched the Galaxy in the mouth. They conceded an own goal. They still, they, they put a, they put a header off a corner, off a, off a post, right? Like they were dangerous. They had opportunities and they, you know, look what Luis Felipe does in the 70th minute, right? Like so many things went bad for, for the Galaxy on that. They don't close him down. Right. Like he's almost he's wondering. He's taking these short little touches. Like, is someone gonna come in and get me now? Am I gonna yeah. cross what am I gonna do? And oh, nobody's coming to me. He takes a shot that is by no means a golasso. It bounces two or three times and beats Klinsman to the far post. So there's blame at the defenders for not closing down. There's certainly blame, which Fanny was fine in, in heaping out to to Klinsman. Um I thought he was poor on the night. Um, and this was his competition. We've seen this a lot, right? From from teams like the Red Bulls for years have given has given Ryan Mirror the opportunity to be that guy, to be to be the open cup goalie, right? To give him minutes, and that's what Klinsman was getting. It was his tournament um, as, as an opportunity to showcase himself, and he, he didn't. Um, but then you hear you hear the comments from Greg Vanny after, right? 
I mean, first he says, uh, he says we were, we were poor. We made, we made too many careless mistakes. He said he, the intensity that was there for the LAFC match in the open cup wasn't there. And, and, and that was, uh, uh, not you know he he couldn't believe that and and I thought I thought more damning was he essentially called his team soft yep. by by saying you know we've got too many guys he said on this team who you know they like to play soccer but they don't like to necessarily get in on the fifty fifty challenges or the grittiness that's needed in in a, in a knockout competition I thought that was really really interesting um, to hear Vanny do that and look if anyone knows about how to succeed in knockout competitions. It's Greg Vanny through his time at Toronto FC. So for this LA team, it was their first taste of it, right? They didn't make the playoffs last year. There was no open cup last year. So their first kind of foray as this group, as this unit in. Um, and if you look at it too, right? Like unless it's an LAFC match, when you look at the roster that the way it's con- like, who is that guy who's getting stuck in on tackles, right? Like who is, getting up there like Sasha Kleshton obviously for years has done that he he's injured right now and he's north of 30 but who else is is not just looking to do the megs and 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 the pretty passes and the golosos like who who wants to get their you know get their hands dirty uh, I don't know maybe Zavaleta and he's not a regular I mean you know right. like they they have a lot of nice players Delgado's hurt as well yeah, and he brings you some of that. Um, we talked about this after the the weekend game here in Atlanta with Franco Ibarra in the Atlanta midfield, how he brings something different. He He's very active defensively. He'll get stuck into the tackle, sent Bryce Duke spinning around like a top on one play. Like He'll get physical, and when you have a bunch of, of good soccer players, good ball players, you got to have that balance of yeah. somebody, not not like an enforcer truly, but just somebody who will do the dirty work and somebody who will will give you, you know, somebody's, you know, clipping Efren Alvarez, taking shots at him. Somebody comes in with a hard tackle, you know, yeah. it's just part of the game. And if you don't have that and, and Vanny says he doesn't, then you got to either try to manufacture it out of what you have, or you've got to use it as a point to go to your sporting director and say, yeah, we need, we need some work here in this upcoming window. And I think Greg Vanny's comments kind of point you in that direction as to, yeah, I don't have enough in this project just yet to do everything I want to do. And th- and those things are are absolutely necessary in a knockout competition, right? Yep, I mean, 100%. how often do we talk about MLS Cup matches just being nasty, right? Like just physical, hard. The league itself is generally physical anyway, and it just gets ramped up in the playoffs. And if you don't, if you guys have, if you have guys who just want to play the the beautiful game and and not you know get stuck in, that's a team that's not gonna you know either make the playoffs or or go far in the playoffs. Yeah, it's just it's needed. I, I'm with you. I think Sacramento outplayed the Galaxy. More shots, uh, less possession, but more shots, more chances created. They were the better team, and they they knock out the Galaxy. So we'll see what they can do going forward. Now you you know that, Omaha that and Sporting Western Kansas side, that Western side is crazy, yeah. right? Like that bracket, you've got Sacramento Republic playing the winner of tonight's Sporting Kansas City Union Omaha mm-hmm. match, right? Like mm-hmm. you could ar- listen, you can make a serious argument that Sacramento Republic is the favorite now to go to the Cup final. Yeah, yeah, you right, can. yeah. From what we've seen from sporting, I mean, obviously they get a nice, they get a, you know, what you would think is an important win at Nashville, but um, they've they got been, some reinforcements coming too. They do, like. they do. Um, not in time for tonight, though. Nope, not for tonight. <laughs> they got to get past the Owls. And, and yeah. Union Omaha is a plus five forty in the juice boxes. Would you step on that? Would you take that? No. Super enticing, man. I, I, I don't know. I can't. It's still a cup set for for the. It's still called the cup set for the reason, right? But yeah. uh, so you could have owls and quails in your <laughs> Western conference. And Brought perhaps by the pigeons. Audubon Society, your Western. And maybe conference. pigeons waiting on the other side. Yeah, all the birds, yeah. man. What's going on with us? Yeah. Um, okay, I want to get into another thing on MLS because this is really bubbling up. And we talked about it a little bit last week with. What's next for DC? What direction are they going? So they were linked with Sonny Cattell. Uh, Hamburg announces this morning he's not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, he, he's not leaving. Uh, he's joined their preseason. 
reportedly he turned down DC's offer. There were some reports that DC was going after Joel Rojas of Emelec, who's been linked with moves to MLS before. Uh, Emelec reportedly has turned that down. Fabio, who was with the Red Bulls last year, he's been linked with DC. He's also linked with Cruz Azul because Atletico Mineiro, he was loaned out last year. Atletico Mineiro has brought somebody else in now anyway, so he's even more surplus to, to needs at the forward position. But there's also... Um, Edison Flores, who is already with Atlas, you know, it'll be made official here shortly. But when you got pictures of him in the training gear getting ready, uh, yeah, there you go. So what is next for DC United with them seemingly striking out on some of these moves and just throwing things at the wall? They got taxi. Yeah, I mean, that was a good one. Um, they The coach who got fired didn't get to use him. Um, <laughs> and now they have an interim and it's. I, I just don't know where they're going because Griffin Yao could be on the way out, Flores yeah. on the way out, and he did not deliver for them in the way that they expected. And, you know, is that on him? Is that on them? Is it somewhere in between? Because he delivered for Peru. Um, I don't know what direction they're heading. Like, are they signing guys to be a pressing team like Lasada wanted to do? Are they going to stay down that road and make tweaks? Uh, do they, are they do looking they to play something different? Yeah. We don't I, know, but do they know? Like, I, I, don't I don't think they do. I mean, the, these kind of moves, you're linked to a, a German forward at Hamburg and you're linked to a Ecuadorian and you're linked to a Brazilian and they're all very different kinds of players. It almost just seems like they're looking at transfer market and just like throwing darts against the wall. Like, we'll take that guy. They're looking like, at deals to rather than like anybody. Fit. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, this this feels like a you know an undervalued player. All right. Okay, we can get him. But does he fit in the puzzle that is DC United on the field? And they lost to Chicago. I hadn't won in ten games over the weekend. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not. Um, you know, like it, certain teams that are below the playoff line, like you can kind of you can kind of chart the path forward or out of that yeah those problems right whether it's like oh you know what they're dealing with some injuries if they can just sort of stay afloat those guys come back reinforcements or um other teams being linked with certain players or even like vancouver right like look they they've been poor um but now <clears throat> you know they've got their their dp coming in and or who has come in i should say and um they bounce back off a bad performance against seattle they get a big win at dallas um Cavallini's playing well so like you could see certain teams you're like all right I could see that or I could see this or and and, and you don't see anything from from DC who are some of those other teams that you sit there and you can sit there and say yeah okay I see something here I see something here who are those ones below the playoff bar that you kind of sit there and say yeah if they do a b or c then I see something who else is there yeah I mean I could well I could tell you who's not and and, and I still even though reinforcements are coming I still don't see necessarily see the way up for skc yeah. um but at least there is that promise of those those players coming up right um let me see let me take a quick look at the uh at the standings uh i think uh i don't know i mean i i don't know if i want to say toronto just because again, I was, gonna say, I, I was gonna ask you about toronto i i, I love i love and say insignia coming but he's not, again, we've said it before, he's not going to play defense, right? Like he's not going to be that, like they still need that um, help. So looking below the line in the East, I mean, look, Cincinnati's right at the lines and and, and Atlanta, I'm not even going to consider them. I think I think they'll be, um, I'm not worried about those teams, right? Like if you go, if you dive deeper, I think DC is sunk. Columbus is an interesting one with their signing now, right? Like they they've, I don't know what they were trying to do with the number nine position. Um, first, we we thought it was Zardis, and then they ship him away, and then they said, "No, Barry's our guy," and then he's not their guy. And um, so now, so now they make a big signing, um, young Colombian. Uh, so that's an interesting one for them. I, I, but I think too, like, look at the line, right? Like Charlotte's at twenty points, and then even. As bad as DC and Chicago are, they're only what six points off for that. So, right. um, I don't think those two teams make it above the line. I, I think they're, to, for me, they're pretty well sunk. 
Um, I'm not necessarily yet buying Miami, but they've got some interesting rumors right now as well, right? So uh, we'll see if 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 those pan out. Um, but I think the team that I'm most most interested, the team that I thought maybe was buried before, but now I might give a puncher's chance. I think is Columbus. Yeah, I, I want to see what Columbus looks like. I don't know if it's the a slam dunk move. Yeah, but I, I'm interested to see how it looks with uh, Kucho up there. Next question: What's more likely in July? Carlos Vela is playing for LAFC, or he's playing for Chivas? <laughs> Uh, dude, if you asked me this before uh, Saturday's post-game press conference, I would have said LAFC. Uh, mm-hmm. Now I'm not so sure. Uh, you hear, look, we've been doing this a long time, right? Like you, you hear the comments, um, and until I think we heard comments, we were just like going by, yeah, you know what? It's going to happen. They're, they're right there. You know, no worries. And then you hear Vela say, yeah, I want to be here. I, I love I love it. We haven't won a, uh, a trophy yet, you know, other than the Shield. But we're, we're, you know, this is a, I want to win something here. But this is a business. And if it doesn't happen, I'll have to go somewhere else. Like, mm-hmm. we've not heard that before, before he no. said it. So, no. um, the, the, the window is, uh, I mean, the finish line is coming up really fast. So, yeah. Um, we're not privy to, to know how far off they were. We were to led to believe it was close. Um, but yeah. I, I don't know, man. I, when I, when I, you leave I, the door open, yeah. these things can happen. And, and and that's what it comes down to for me, because you, you get into like, you know, ah, well, who could do this? And we talked about Club America before and, and they've got the money. They could they could pull this kind of a move off. But Chivas is, is even more interesting because, and Fox Deportes has a, a good breakdown of this. They've, they've got the money. That's not a problem for Chivas. They're as big of a brand as you're going to find in Mexico. And they need to make a splash mm. in a big way. So they, they have money to spend and they need to spend it. And when you start looking at who else they could get and how much it's going to cost them, because Remember, Chivas, only players you can represent Mexico. So it limits your player pool. They're not going to go get another good player out of League MX um, that is Ecuadorian or Argentine or whoever. They're only going to get certain players. Vela fits that. He came up through the Chivas Academy, never played for them. He moved to Europe very early. You can get him for less money than you can get other guys they're linked to because you don't have to pay a transfer fee. And make a uh, bigger splash just yeah. in, in, in the public relations yep. department and in, in the jersey sale and everything that comes with all it. of it. Victor yeah. Guzman, who uh Pachuca player who had a great season last year, was linked with a move with Chivas before, didn't get done. He's linked again. You gotta pay Pachuca probably eight, ten million to get him. And you gotta pay him. Bela? He wants uh, and, and Fox Deportes breaks it down. He wants a three year deal. He wants four million a year. You can do that, and it's cheaper than getting anybody else. Yep. You can bump those numbers around a little bit. Biggest thing is, and and Fox Deportes, you know, breaks this down. I think they're they're dead on. His life and quality of life in Los Angeles, and being somewhat anonymous in LA, is going to be very different if he goes to Guadalajara. Mm-hmm. Yes. And does he want that? And he's not a typical kind of guy like he's a little different well that's the that's the um you know not not to not to um you know pub my own work here but when when i the the story that i did on juan carlos osorio um that came out monday you know he was saying something very similar to this right he was he was telling him when he was still in spain like don't leave yet like what are you doing like you're still young like it's not time yet to go to to MLS, right? And he he said those exact words, Jason. He said he's just a different guy. He's just a different person. And he go and oh, sorry, I said, look, well, you know, who am I now to say I, I was wrong, right? Like he obviously checked all the boxes. He still can't believe that he's not in the national team setup. Um, but you're right. Like he can live, and that's one of the the things about all these guys. I remember speaking to David Villa about a number of a number of times. You could live a certain way 
in in a New York City and in LA that you can't um, say in Barcelona or or certainly in this case in a, in a Guadalajara, right? So uh, how much value is in that uh, as as well? So there's a lot of things for him to for him to to balance here in, in, in this in this decision. Knowing full well that we will discuss this again at this point next week, mm-hmm. what does your gut tell you this week about Carlos Vela? Last week, I thought he was staying. This week, I don't know. I don't think he's staying. Yeah, I don't think he's staying either. I I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, you're looking at now maybe his last two games. Mm-hmm. With LA, they're at home. They they host the Red Bulls. They host uh, Dallas on the 29th. His contract ends on the 30th. Yep. Crazy to think that this is where it could be. But again, to me, when you leave that door open so long, things change. Like in January, would Chivas have gone for this? Maybe not. Now they're more. It's it's more necessary. And to me to too, to the longer it. the longer this drags out and gets closer to the edge, I I think the parameters likely change, right? Yeah. Like his his ask is now maybe more. Yeah. Um, from from LAFC, whether it's term or or price or both. Yeah. Because there's this other opportunity there. And the element we don't know is because he can talk to other he can like solicit offers right now because he's in the last uh, few days of his contract. But you're in the last. Uh, six months of the contract, you can do that. So he can literally get offers from from other clubs. But then we get into the unknown of he'd be a mid-season free agent in Major League Soccer. Yeah. And does somebody else in MLS put numbers in front of him and say, hey, Miami's really nice this time of year. <laughs> you know, like, well, what could happen there? That's that's a completely uncharted territory for us. You're right. That that could make it really interesting, right? There there are teams that have uh, and and destinations, Miami being the one that can can do that, right? Can I, and, can I throw a wild card at you? Okay. Um, if you are a and there's two who fit this bill specifically, but I'm I'm thinking of one first. That if you are a new owner. And you're trying to make a splash and you're trying to make your team relevant in your, your market where you haven't been. And you're in a market where signing a prominent Mexican player would make a splash. And you could use it because this year in one case has been pretty decent in, in your first year of ownership in Houston. Yep. <laughs> but you're in a bigger market in Chicago. And if you add Vela to that team, now I don't know off the top of my head their designated player situations or any of that. Right. But if you put Vela there, knowing what Cuauhtémoc Blanco did in the past in Chicago, and knowing what Vela can do on the field, and you give Shakiri a running buddy and Carlos Vela, hmm, it, Joe Mansueto might need to be uh, looking at the numbers. It's also it's also a gamble because Shakiri's been. It is. A bit injured, and Vela we know is injured, right? It is. So like, it is. Have, and you're you throwing. You've already thrown highest, eight plus at Shakiri, right? You can I have think two of the highest paid for the money players then. in the league. Mm-hmm. You know, sidelined in the in the trainers room. Um, yeah, I was no. Absolutely. I would like I, the Houston thing is I, I think almost almost more interesting because then you could even I have Hector Herrera, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, that's a, that's a really good point because he's coming in, and and you could add Vela on top of that. And that would be fascinating too. I mean, and those are two markets where if you bring Carlos Vela in the door, things get really interesting. And especially if it's a Houston, right? Like how much would LAFC be sweating? If a Western conference rival now brings in, you know, two prominent Mexican players takes your best player of, of your short time off you, you know, away from you, and now, and now you've got to battle them, you know, for for spots in the Western Conference. I need chaos on July first, Dylan. Oh, That's basically goodness. what I need. 
I need chaos. I need I need clubs like sending him uh, care packages like that morning <laughs> in MLS. Yeah, Siegel sends him a, a box with the uh, you know, that opens up and butterflies come out, and it's a Houston jersey with Vela on the back and whatever number he wants. Man, that'd be amazing stuff. Um, anything else on the MLS front you're working on right now? Uh, no sleep is what I'm working on. <laughs> uh, uh, no, just uh, you know, uh, so much more cup fun tonight um yep. hudson river derby part of that um that should be really fun so uh just watching these matches and, and in the weekend uh you know more more comes v 16s on the horizon yeah we're back into the uh the the chaos now and there's not there's only one more international break so yep. uh it is a, a marathon now the rest of the way and it's going to be consistent um we'll talk to you next week thanks for hanging out with us appreciate it yeah boys Thanks. Let's get into it with uh, another one of the friends of the show. Mike Con uh, hanging out with us. Hey guys, good morning. How are you? We are good. We were workshopping where Carlos Vela could land after his contract at LAFC ends in like eight days. Are we thinking somewhere within the league? Well, I mean, that was what I hypothesized here because Chivas's name has come up um, in Mexico and that's where he started and, and definitely a, a ton of potential there uh, and they need him and they need a splash. But there's two new owners in the league in Houston and in Chicago and two markets that a Mexican oh. player would thrive in. Absolutely. Um, that could get really interesting if he's a free agent in MLS because LAFC doesn't resign him. Well, I'll tell you, you know, in the case of Chicago, that attendance number they had a couple of weeks ago when LA Galaxy was in town yep. uh, with Chicharito, to me, that you've got to immediately um, start crunching numbers if you're Chicago and determine if the the expense is worth it. And it, I think it probably would be. You know, if, if you can take your average attendance in Chicago from, I don't know, 17, 18 up to 25, I, I would think the Vela move would probably pay for itself pretty quickly. It's just, it, it's a little hard to wrap your head around the idea that a contract could expire, a player becomes a free agent, and he lands with another team in MLS, a mm -hmm. player of this yeah. caliber. Yeah. It's never uh, happened that no. we had a, a player like this have their seat, their contract in. They'd qualify for free agency and, you know, I mean, he could be somewhere else July 1st. <laughs> it, it, it's wild. You know, you, you could see this happen with, um, you, you know, kind of a journeyman player, a depth piece or something like that, but someone who was the league MVP a couple of years ago uh, and is probably one of the 10 biggest names in the league. I think that's probably pretty fair to say. Mm -hmm. uh, wild to think that could happen. Houston's another market where I think it would make a ton of sense um, for the, the reasons that you outlined. Um, does LA Galaxy get feisty here? That'd be uh, hilarious. Oh you, you know, I, I, how funny would that be? Now, I you also get into the question of like designated player spots and salary and wage bills and all that. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm LA Galaxy and and I can get Vela and stick it to the crosstown rival, yeah. I don't care what I got to do with somebody's designated player spot. I'm doing it. Like I think that'd be kind of fun. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the it, billboards alone oh. would make it worthwhile. Well, and can you imagine the next El Trafico after yeah. that would happen? I, I, I just that would be nuts, and it, it, it probably won't happen that way. I need this now. You know, <laughs> I, honestly, I need this, it, I need what, this what so we, much better. What are we putting our juice boxes on here? Um, my bet is that Vela is still on LAFC in nine days. My bet right now is Chivas. Okay. John? I think I think Chivas needs him the most and has the the most willingness to to give him the money he wants. Right. What do I you think, think I think he goes to Spain. I think his wife has a, a lot of pull in this decision. There's no offers though in Spain, John. Zero, none. And their season, like they're they're starting preseason here, like almost immediately because their season's going to start beginning of August. Like there's nothing on the table from Spain. I just want chaos. That's what I want more than anything else. 
well, I, yeah. there's more chaos if, if LA Galaxy and oh, Chicago crazy. and Miami and Houston are, are bidding for him with Chivas and hey, throw Club America into it as well. Let's have some fun. That's chaos. If if Real Sociedad joins the mix, that's not chaos. I just want chaos in general. That's not chaos though. I I, I want I want the LA Galaxy to sign Carlos Vela. <laughs> that's you want chaos? Yes. That's what you want. Because like Rick Neuheisel ads in the LA Times calling out USC. That's that's what we're right. talking about. We here. have it's nothing near that. It, it's Rick Neuheisel does not no 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 no. This is uncharted territory for Major League Soccer. If you have that kind of potential for an action, man, I hope the Galaxy at <laughs> least signal that they want to do that. Just give me at least the the possibility of it. LA Galaxy, please. We're kicking the tires on a transaction after July first. They they can say it flat out. He's out of con. He's he's in the last few days of his contract. They can say like, yes, if he is a free agent, we would be very interested in signing Carlos Vela. Could you imagine Vanny saying that in a in a, in a press opportunity? This I week? wish they were playing this weekend and he could say it to unsettle him. Oh, <laughs> the drama! Be amazing. This is what we need in this league. Yeah, it'd be honestly it'd be great for the league. It um, would be. It, it really would be. Um, but again, I mean, w- when we assess the probability of it happening up against uh, the other possibilities, I, it's probably pretty low on the list. But I, I mean, Mike, I mean, but, but if you think about L- I mean, if you think about LAFC, LAFC has pinned themselves into a corner now with the clock ticking at eight t minus eight days, where they're probably going to have to do one of two things or both. You're going to have to give him years and you're going to have to give him the money that he wants. And you're probably going to have to overpay because you're this close to the window. And the question then becomes really should LAFC do this or are they going to do it because they feel like they're in a corner? Yeah. I mean, yes. um, Yes. To all that it's, um, the clock is ticking. Options are weaning. Um, but, I mean, how many times in sports, let alone in soccer, has something materialized at quite the last minute? Um, I, I'll, I'll give you an Atlanta United example. I mean, Luis Arruja was not really even on our collective radar. It, when I say R, I mean, you know, those of us who observe Atlanta United, not necessarily within the team. Luis Arruja, we didn't really hear that name until – how many hours left in the summer transfer window last year? I mean, I feel like it was pretty late. Yeah. About um, 36, if I remember right. Yeah, it was about mean, a day it, and a half before. Yeah. I mean, time is the great equalizer where it does tend to um, enhance probabilities right at the end. So I, I, I'm just saying I would not rule out the possibility at all. In fact, I would even put my money on Vela being on LAFC when this is all over. Yeah, I, I don't think you can rule it out at all. Um, LA Galaxy, by the way, do have three designated players. One of them is Douglas Costa. And if I He's, could uh, make could the buy move him down. to open buy. that spot out. I don't know yeah. if you could buy him down. I think you might be able to buy Kevin Cabral down. He's a he's a young designated player, but he's a designated player, not a U-22. Um, he would be the most likely. But if if it came down, if I'm the LA Galaxy, and I have the opportunity to make this splash and – get every eyeball you could possibly have on you and pair up Vela and Chicharito for the galaxy and hurt my crosstown rivals who have hurt me since they came into the league. Mm -hmm. I would do whatever it takes to get Douglas cost off my roster and sign Carlos Vela. Like it would be the biggest move that the galaxy have made since Beckham. Mm -hmm. Chicharito is a big move, but if you add Vela to him and subtract him from LAFC, (laughs) Oh my God goodness <laughs> well we'll say the idea started here shall we yes uh, i, I don't think fine if you're listening get it done get <laughs> it done we need to tell tatino that we're having this conversation if he goes to houston that's a good move too if he goes yep. to chicago that's a good move too um lots of he's he's got options now you know we don't know what has been floated his way the chivas thing is is you know at least being talked about heavily in mexico right now Club America's name has come up before because they're linked to every substantial player. But, you know, those two, okay, that's that's a big deal. That's that's a big deal if he goes to Chivas and represents them for the first time at the the senior level because he, he grew up in their academy and then went to Europe. But if he moves 
to anybody else in MLS, it gets really fascinating. And the conversation about it would be great for the league. Well, hey, maybe LA Galaxy smarting after what happened last night feels like they have to make a big splash now to their supporters. You need maybe. to make a splash. And, and That's you a little tongue-in-cheek, but maybe maybe not. No. Just, I, you never know. Look, if, 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 I'm, if I'm building that team and I can add Vela and subtract Douglas Costa, Win. my team's better. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm better now. I do have more injury concern, maybe not a ton because Costa is up there a little bit, but my team's better. Like it's not even just a marketing move. Like it would make them a better team. And Vela and Chicharito, by all accounts, have a good relationship. So I mean, yeah. you'd be getting two guys together, just like Houston could with Herrera there. So yeah, it's it, look. This is, I'm just, I'm, I'm shocked that we're at this point with a club like LAFC that hasn't gotten this lockdown yet, because like I said before, when that door stays open, things can happen and situations can change other places that, that then you're caught with the door open and somebody coming in your house and and taking your best player. But I'm shocked. This isn't a bigger story. Well, it's all, yeah. But that point, to your point there, I mean, in 2019, LAFC was the darling of the league, and anytime Bob Bradley coughed, it was getting reported on. Well, I just I mean, went up two more rank, uh, sections in the power rankings. So. Well, they were – anytime he – I don't want to say coughed because they didn't really talk anything negatively about it, and this is a negative story about LAFC because they might be losing somebody. Well, that's a good point, yeah. You know, yeah, like, it, that, can you imagine if you had an NFL – free agent possibility halfway through somebody who's done what what carlos vela's done you had a mlb you know free agent possibility midway through the season not a trade possibility well no free agent I mean, possibility no i mean what i keep thinking of is imagine if nba contracts were january 1 to december 31 not july 1 to no. june 30 okay so imagine nba contracts are january 1 to december 31 and you're at Christmas Day, and uh, Jason Tatum has not yet signed an extension with the Celtics. That's what it's like. Mm-hmm. That's what it's like right now. And and who has the leverage? The player. The player. Taylor's got every <laughs> bit of it right now. The player's the player. got all the leverage. Uh, it, it's a wild situation. And again, going back to what I said at the beginning of the segment, never before in the history of the league has a player – this high profile been in this situation. Um, it, I don't think he ends up with another MLS club. I think he ends up with LAFC, but I don't think he ends up with another MLS club. I, I think I, I just I, need I Greg Vaney to make some, Europe, some otherwise. I, I need Greg Vaney to make some uh, interesting comments and in interviews at least. Give me that, yeah, part, or like please. a passive aggressive social media post or something yeah. like that. Something, ah, you know, they v- v- look move across bit. town and, and have a, a nice new house, something, whatever. Well, like, that's the other thing. Some... I mean, does anyone know where Vela lives? Like, is his home on the market? I mean, again, NBA comparison when Damian yeah. Lillard put his home on, or not Damian Lillard, Lamarcus Aldridge put his yeah. home on the market in Portland. That was front page news for a week with fans kind of twisting like, oh, well, no, nah, he probably just wants a bigger house. No, he's moving. No, he wants to go. Oh, no, no, no. He just probably wants a better neighborhood. No, he's moving. And it turned out he moved. Uh, so, you know, if anyone wants to do some Zillow stalking on Carlos Vela's house, let's uh, let's see what we can come up with there. Could get fun. Could get really fun. Um, do you think his number's in the phone book? I mean, we, we could probably find this out. dot com and do reverse phone. Yeah, I'm going to guess no, but who knows? You never know. Uh, a couple things on the business side in MLS. Uh, Toronto and BMO Financial Group, a 10-year renewal and expansion of their foundational partnership. So BMO will be still in the front of the shirt. Uh, BMO Field will still be BMO Field. They're going to expand that, which was always a a next step once the, the World Cup announcement was made. It's going to be 46,000 plus. Yeah, and quick question on that. In the yeah. World Cup, are you allowed to keep the corporate name on the stadium or do you have to wipe that off? I don't know, and it's changed over the years. Um, I know in the Olympics you have to wipe it off. Yeah, but I don't I wasn't know. sure I... in the World Cup if you had to do that. I, I... In fact, it wasn't Allianz Arena called Allianz Arena in 2006. I thought so, yeah. When Munich had games. I have to go back. I think it was. Um, I think it might. I don't know if they had a 
a FIFA relationship that allowed that and other venues weren't. I don't know. Um, and it could be different by the time we get to well, 26. The reason why I ask is BMO got a bargain if they're allowed to keep their yeah. name on the stadium during the World Cup. That's a very, very corporate friendly deal. Yeah, I would imagine that even if FIFA refers to it and their broadcast partners refer to it as, you know, Toronto World Cup Stadium, um, local Everyone reports knows are all gonna, field. Yeah, and they're not going to be able to wipe all the branding away. And it'll still be there, even if it's not all the way there. Yeah. Uh, the other interesting announcement is Seattle Sounders uh, made a sale of a stake in the team, 3 to 5%, somewhere in between that. Um, unknown buyer. It's not a controlling interest stake. So it, it's a little bit of a discount because it, they have no power with this. If it was a controlling stake, it would have brought a, a higher valuation. But the valuation on the deal puts the Sounders at $680 million. And Front Page Sports puts that in like a middle of the pack NHL team. Calgary, for example, yeah. was valued at the same uh, level by Forbes last December. So, well, you know, way, you, don't be, one. you don't want to be associated with Calgary. They've well, got no. big no, arena problems. Right no, now. But the valuation of the, the franchise. Yes. And if yeah. you're you're in that kind of a realm and you are again, and this is a discounted one because it's literally a non voting, non controlling stake. Um, that's a good sign for Seattle. And, and yes. I think their valuation by Forbes was a little bit more than this. But again, this is a different kind of stake than a normal one. So, well, honestly, it's really good for the entire league because mm -hmm. this goes into the computation of what the expansion fee will be for yep. if it's going to be Vegas or whoever. I mean, it sounds like it's going to be Vegas, whoever the next team is. That that's going to go into the computation of the expansion fee. So it's good for Seattle, but it's really, really good for the league. Um, I wonder, in a way, and I don't know if we have any economics professors on the Twitch pitch, I'm wondering, in a way, if now would be a good time for the league in the midst of runaway inflation to try to lock in that expansion fee now before there would be any kind of deflation. Um, again, I'm not an economics professor. That's just kind of a back-of-the-napkin idea. But um, the league... It, it's funny, it's unfortunate for Sacramento, but the league's going to end up getting a higher expansion fee out of, 100%. you know, if it's Vegas or whoever, than they would have gotten out of Sacramento just two years ago. Mm -hmm. I do wonder why that hasn't gotten locked up yet. And and it's a little bit of the, the Vela comparison as to like, oh, it's going to get done. Well, why hasn't it? And Vegas had a couple of possibilities I'm with you. It seems like it would be a good time to go ahead and lock that in and announce it. And, well, and it, it, it could be locked in. It's just not announced. Yeah. That does can, happen. Can I interject? If yeah. I'm on the purchaser side of things, I would have wanted to see that media deal before jumping in. Um, yeah, could be. You know, I, I think that's that's a big piece of your revenue. I mean, you, you're. You're making three and a half million dollars off the current media deal. Now it's going to be eight and a half million dollars annually. I know that that doesn't sound like a lot, but that is a lot. That's not an insignificant number. Uh, you know, you might not want to close on anything until you know exactly what the ledger sheet is going to look like. Could be. Um, and and look, they could be all but done, even if it's not signed off yet. I mean, I I've, I've said it before. Like we were in pretty strong understanding that Atlanta was getting a team not a year before, but less than, you know, around that, like nine months or so before where they're in the final stages and it's, it's getting down to the, the final T's being crossed and the final I's being dotted on it. So it could be all but done, but it's the Vegas thing has lingered out there for a minute and hasn't gotten finalized just yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe, Maybe there's a mystery city or a mystery yeah. bidder. Um, and maybe the the governors have to determine, do we want to take this thing up to 32 right now? Um, yeah, that's another part to it. You haven't, really heard, you haven't really heard rumors about that. I feel like you would on something like that. You, you've heard Don Garber open the door to it. He... he he initially, and, and this might have been MLS Cup 18 when he was here, he did make it kind of strong at that point that they were going to stop at 30. Didn't say permanent, but they were going to stop at 30. Now it feels like that door is is open 
to going further, but you got to get number 30 done. You got to get number 30 done sooner rather than later. You don't want to be at 29 for a long period of time. So yeah. you'd like to be 30 and 24. Go ahead and get it you know, out of the way and get to your even number. You can go longer down the road. You could go, you know, it to, you can stick with 30 until after the world cup, for example, mm-hmm. and see mm-hmm. where the interest is. But I think the possibility is floated. So San Diego knows they could put something together. Um, Phoenix knows they could put something together. I think there probably are some mystery folks out there. You know, we're, we're seeing them pop up buying clubs in, in Europe, you know, or we're, we're hearing a lot of American investment in different places there's going to be people kicking the tires after this Apple deal on and with the world cup coming, there's going to be people kicking the tires for a 2028 launch, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think again, too, when in due diligence, I mean, look at your expansion markets post 2016 and how they're drawing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Atlanta is selling out every game. Minnesota is selling out every game. LAFC selling out every game. Cincinnati, I think, selling out every game. I think they're doing yep. pretty well, yep. right? Yep. And Nashville uh, announced 23,000 season yeah. tickets on an official uh, wait list. Exactly. Charlotte is selling out every game. Um, Miami's the outlier, but there's a reason for it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking at I'm looking at that. I, I keep coming back to the in stadium experience and in stadium revenue, and that's where it's appealing for a buyer. And uh, Jason's right. You know, if, um, I, I think there's gotta be more interest than just Vegas, yeah. uh, San Diego and Phoenix. In fact, we know Sacramento still has interest. They're just trying to get it together. Yeah. Louisville still has, has interest. Louisville's kind of floated out there that they would be opposed to it. Indy's name has been around before. Um, I've heard rumblings of other places, nothing confirmed. Um, but yeah, that you're going to have somebody pop up. You could have a surprise with 31 or 32. Here's the other thing too. The way your new media deal is set up with a streamer Mm -hmm. market size, no longer becomes a determinant in expansion, No, which brings Louisville into play, which frankly brings Albuquerque into play. Um, ownerships there. Absolutely. It does. You know, it, now, because of the way that audience will be measured, you're not dependent on TV market size uh, to enhance the value of your television pack. And by the way, it's locked in for 10 years anyway. Yeah. You, the market covered... size has, really is not a determinant anymore mm-hmm. in um, in where expansion can be viable. Um I still believe Albuquerque is going to be a good market for this league. I really do think that. I I'm I would encourage this league to very closely examine Louisville's another. Yeah. Very like closely Louisville. examine cities with a large enough population that could support a major league team and does not currently have one. Albuquerque, Louisville, Norfolk. Uh, I'm just spitballing here. Um, Omaha, uh, you know, places like that. Uh, even I'd even say Oklahoma city, you know, they have the thunder because Uh, now you're looking at, you're looking at the fabric of the market. You're not looking at the size of the market that has the fabric attached. I think you're purely looking at the quality of the ownership. That um, is at the yes, next step, right? If Warren Buffett comes in and says, "I want to put a team in Omaha," Scott no. Garber better be flying out to Omaha immediately with papers, right? You know that that is yes. It's not the geographic location; it's the quality of ownership that's going to elevate this league. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I think this is one of the not talked about aspects of this media deal that really hasn't gotten a lot of thought yet. Um, Your media deal now takes the market size out of the conversation and it, it, it's, it puts it solely on the quality of the ownership, which is a good position for the league to be in. So yeah, if you get the right owner who wants to put a team in Albuquerque, but he's going to, or she is going to spend a lot of money 
uh, to have a high quality product that's going to enhance the overall quality and value of the league, put Albuquerque in the league. Yep. You know, same with any other Wichita, same with Billings, Montana, same with Boise. I'm mean, actually not joking about Boise. I think that'd no, be a good one. I, I have no problem. League. Again, it, it is that ownership. And if they can do everything that the league needs them to do, I mean, of, of course, you're not going to put it in a small town, but if you put it in a place where you can draw 30,000 people a game, you put it in a place where you can build an academy, you you put it in a place that, you know, you have a stadium that is suitable. You you do those things. This deal doesn't make you feel like you have to go to Phoenix or Detroit or a city because of where they fit on the market with TV markets. You can go to a place that has a committed owner who is willing to invest and maybe is in a smaller market, but yeah. that could even be better. Or, you know, the other thing too, look, it opens the door to if if somebody wants to put another team in the Northeast and it's yeah. an owner that comes in that you want in the league yep. that can do everything you want. Now that's far more possible than it would have been. Yeah, a hundred percent correct. Absolutely. Um, if you want to put another team in Canada, I think that that would be on the table as well. See, there's there's a lot of options right now, uh, and and the options have been created because the league has added a lot of great owners over the last ten years. Arthur Blank being one of them. Um, so now it's okay, in my opinion, it's okay to lean into it. You know, like Louisville's a good example. If you can create an infrastructure in Louisville where the NWSL team, the MLS team, you have a, a, a Boys and Girls Academy. Um, you already have a stadium that you'd probably have to expand. Yep. Uh, and that's but, on the that can be on the cards. That was yeah. in the in the plans originally, and it still is. Yeah. Um, you know, you've you've already got the NWSL infrastructure there and good ownership. Now you can lean into that. Um so, yeah, it, it'll be exciting to see where this goes down the road. I don't want to see the league overexpand. I, I know we've had that discussion the before, number. too. Yeah. But I, I think you can comfortably get to 32. I, I think there's enough of a player pool right now where you can comfortably get to 32. Yep. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't go much beyond that. But if you get to 32, you're adding a couple more markets. If you go beyond that, more. you're changing the format of your league, which is possible. I mean, if you go to 40 teams and you have an MLS one and two, then we're having a completely different discussion about what everything yeah. looks like. But at 32, you do everything the way you've been doing it. You can, of course, go to divisions if you want, like a format thing, whatever. But when I when I say, like, you go to 40, you're not going to have 40 teams in, in the league as it's currently constructed. You would have to then reimagine what it looks like. And the business takes you there. The business takes you there. But you can get to 32 comfortably now or now-ish during the terms of this this broadcast deal easily. Easily you can be at 32 by the time this deal ends. Yep. And, and be in a good position to grow. Absolutely. It'd be a good good fit. be fun to see where this thing goes. And, and these kinds of sales like with Seattle of a 3 to 5% stake, you know, it shows you where the business is. And it's pretty healthy right now in MLS. It's good business to be in. Um, We'll get into to more of the particulars of everything from the Miami game today on stoppage time and looking ahead to Toronto. Um, is there anything from Miami as you've had a chance to reflect on it a little bit that, that stands out from Sunday? I thought George Campbell was terrific. Happy uh, birthday, George Campbell, by the way. Birthday, happy birthday. It, well, ooh, is he 21 today? He is 21 today. Oh, good for George. And you're going to a place this weekend where it's legal at, well, anyhow, um, <laughs> at 19. But it, he wouldn't do that anyway before a game, I'm certain. Not before that, a game. Not before a it's game. Although we you don't we do are it. staying after. We, we are, are staying. staying we are staying Saturday night. Um, so maybe I, I, thought George was, I thought George was really, really good. Look, I, I, I love the move to bring in a goalkeeper and a center back. Had to be done just as the numbers game. But... Uh, I go into this road trip now thinking that you can get four points because your goal key, the spine of your team's looking a little bit better than maybe it looked even a week or two ago. Um, you know, I think you can go into Toronto with Rio Snovo, Campbell playing with Bronco, um, and then Abara, really, a, a bar. I think we haven't really talked a whole lot about him in detail. 
Uh, and then obviously what Joseph is giving you up top right now, I feel really good about the spine of this team. Moreno, obviously part of it too. Um, I think the spine of this team is such that you can go into Toronto and get three and you can go into Red Bulls and get one. But Campbell, it's like I told him on the full-time report, I, that's as well as I've ever seen him play. And I've seen him play some really good games over the years. Uh, very composed, very fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mean fluid in terms of his positioning was fluid. Uh, fluid might be the wrong word. Very viscous. <laughs> you know, he, he just he moved around very comfortably and very uh, under control. Uh, really, really admired the way he played. Uh, really admired the way that Atlanta United also, I mean, this is something that I didn't really think of until I, I went back and watched the game. The way that Atlanta United maintained their poise and their self-discipline in a match where there was a first half red card to your opponent, I thought was notable. Uh, and a lot of times when you have a first half red card, you tend to see situations where the red card ledger is evened up maybe a little bit more quickly than it would be if you're playing 11 v 11, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought Atlanta United did a really, really good job in the fair play department to not fall into any traps. Not a single Atlanta United player booked on Sunday. I, You know, that's not insignificant to me. Uh, against a Miami team that was getting a little bit chippy tactically. And it, right at the very end, getting very chippy. Uh, so really like to see the way that Atlanta United maintained their poise as well. It, it, not an insignificant thing, in my opinion. When you look at, and this is probably also teasing uh, what's going to be going on with stoppage time. When you look at the two new additions, Mike, what's your first impression? Uh, well, one of them's absurdly tall. Hi, uh, <laughs> baby. Goutinho, 6'5". Yeah. Jason, was Godinho the keeper when uh, we had the friendly down there in February? I'm trying to remember. I'd have to go back and look at my notes. I think he might have been. Um, he might I, have played have, in that. Yeah, I, he was definitely on my board. Uh, I can't remember if he played in that or not. He was the regular but, in the Apertura in the fall and was in and out in the Clausura, although he ended up playing a, a decent number of games. Uh, he announced fairly early on, I think it was after we were down there, um, that he wasn't going to do a new deal with Chivas, and then they they kind of pushed him to the side, and he had to come right. back in because there was an injury at the goalkeeper position. I don't remember if he played in that game or not, but yeah. You know, with the relationship that, that Gonzalo has with Chivas, you know, he's going to know everything about Coutinho and not just – the videos but he's going to know people who know him and who he is as an individual and i'm, right. I'm sure those factors are, are big here yeah uh, and the other thing is you, you get to you get to training pretty quickly i mean you, you can't register and play until the seventh but you, you can start to start to lay the foundation mm -hmm. um which is advantageous so but i honestly do believe that purata and godinho I really do believe have to come in and win jobs. Hundred percent, right oh, they, they yeah. have they, no, no job can be handed to either of them. No, I, I don't. Good position to be in. Uh, hopefully, there's not an injury or something that occurs that makes it necessary to just hand them a job. But That's I think you're awesome. in a really good spot right now where you're going to have a competition, and the competition, by the way, benefits Rocco Rios Novo and George Campbell and Alan Franco and Alex DeJohn as well. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, everybody benefits from that. You you need you needed to get a couple more numbers in. You've got it now. And I yeah, I don't think either one was signed to to walk into a starting lineup. Yeah. They've got and, and the, that spot. Sorry to interrupt. I, the one other thing I really like, you play New York City Sunday, you turn around and play Austin Saturday, RSL Wednesday, Orlando the following Sunday. You're getting into some match compression now. So um you have a little more cover in those positions, which is going to be really, really important as you go through that. Yeah, the Austin game is the first that they would be eligible to play in. Um, right. But you, you've got that cover and you've got them training and you'll have some basis of comparison. So got to well, start winning these games in hand, too, uh, or at least getting results yeah. in these games in hand, because that's a way to jump up the table really quickly. You're sixth right now in the East in points per match. Yep. So the games in hand are a major factor right now. But uh, you, you've got to take care of business with these games in hand starting next Thursday uh, against Red Bull. At least get results. 
uh, again, just adding some numbers is going to make it a little more doable, I think. Win the home games, get results on the road, steal games, steal three points on the road where you can, and they'll be fine. And you just you have to do that. And now you've got three on the road. So whatever you can get out of this trip is, is very valuable. And it needs to be more than just three, I think. Four, I'll take it. Um, if you gave me five right now, I'd, I'd sign up for it in a heartbeat. We'll get into all of that on stoppage time today, 2 o'clock. Uh, Facebook.com slash 929 the game. Also, twitch.tv slash stoppage time 929. And then the podcast will go out uh, hopefully tomorrow. So. Hopefully, yes. Cover. We will we will cover all of that stuff and more. We'll get into some more questions and such then. So, all Mike, right, thank sounds, you. See you in a little bit. That's good, guys. See ya. Be good, Mike. John, tell us about our good friends over at Eliminize. I could certainly do that. QR code over my left shoulder for those of you watching on Twitch. For a free, clean, fresh air, one place you need to go. It's Eliminize Service, deodorizing enclosed spaces like houses, apartments, and condos. Eliminize has created a customized so- a solution that eliminizes all organic odors, including those like pet cigarettes and food. Realtors and property managers use Eliminize service to eliminize bad odors to help them sell or rent their homes that much faster. It's a turnkey process, which, which helps work with realtors and property managers to turn those facilities around. It's kind of the environment. We like that these days. A very green way of going about things to get rid of odors without any kind of toxic residue whatsoever. Different than your favorite masking agent that you have under your sink of choice, because when you reach under the sink, you pull out that masking agent, you spray it in the air. That's why they call it a masking agent. You're just masking the odor. You're not attacking the problem all the way down to the molecule like the Lemonize Service does with their proven scientific formula. Pricing very, very easy. One of two ways. Either by cubic feet or parts per million to come up with a price that's affordable for you, offering results in 24 hours or less. If you have any other questions, frequently asked or otherwise, one place you need to go, the website, eliminize.com. But do us a favor here at SDH. After the .com, go slash Atlanta so they know what part of the world that you are talking to them from to end a sentence and a preposition. So your full homework assignment, E-L-I-M-I-N-I-Z-E dot com slash Atlanta. Eliminize.com slash Atlanta for odor-free, clean, fresh air. Here in the midweek, as we talk about everything going on in the world of soccer, Eliminize Service, proud sponsors of everything. SDH. All right. And there's this. Ah, there's this. Mm-hmm. Hi, Jared. Peter and the Wolf. Hi, Jason. It's not Peter and the Wolf. Don't tell them to come hit a, us with a copyright violation, John. That's what it sounds like. It's not. We've it's had not, this though. conversation. A, a, a lurking villain in the forest is it's the Grinch ripoff. At least that's what it's called. Grinch ripoff. There you go. Not exactly what it's called, but anyway. It does have a very like uh the the, the Grinch sequel energy to it, like yes. Grinch Knight, whatever it was called. The, the, the title of the track that is available to be used by our program. Again, it is available to be used, copyright people. It has the Grinch in the title of it. So I think that's what they're going for. Anyway, let's get into uh, some other news on the board. Uh, Rocco Camiso is saying things in Italy, and he is disputing reports uh, that Fiorentina are up for sale. He says the club's not for sale. Uh, but the reports say that a Saudi Arabian consortium are ready to pay 350 million euro to buy Fiorentina. Uh, Rocco Camiso bought the club in 2019. He has been very vocal in his frustrations with Italian football, with building a stadium in Florence, with lots of different things. Um, he just gets frustrated very easily. Calcio Mercato say uh, not only is the club up for sale, but a buyer's been lined up and it's 350 million euro. Um, Camiso was criticized heavily by Fiorentina fans for allowing uh, Dusan Vlahovic to join Juventus. Um, he didn't really have much of a choice on that, people. But anyway, uh, he defended himself and was critical of Vlahovic and, and his entourage for their part on it, blah, 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 which he was trying to save face because, look, he wasn't going to be able to keep the guy. He didn't want to sign a new deal. He had to get something for him. He did. He would have loved to have sold him somewhere else. Vlahovic didn't want to go anywhere else kind of limited in what you can do there. And it's one of the times that I think in we're going to see in growing numbers where a player 
takes control of their future. And he didn't play the contract out here, but he, he threatened that he would. Um, players are going to have more say in these things going forward. And clubs are only able to do so much. So, I mean, fans can be mad and whatever. And, oh, well, we don't I want to sell guys to Juventus. Well, when the player is forcing a move to Juventus, it's either bring in the money or don't. Yeah, you're, you're limited here. So that part's stupid. Um, if you buy Fiorentina, look, Camiso has done some good things there. He's got their training center that should be finished by the end of this calendar year. One of the best complexes in Serie A. Um, they're, they're back in European football for the first time in five years. He's got them in a much better position. So, you know, I don't know what he bought the club for, but I would assume he would be seeing a nice return on this. And whoever buys in, if they do, and he said it's not up for sale, would be ready to jump on a rocket ship a little bit here if they can put more investment into it and take it to another level. But you go back to the conversations that we've had on, on soccer over there with Nick Alifi many times. You're not going to easily get a stadium done no matter who you are. These things are very difficult in Italy. They need to happen because the clubs are always going to be fighting with an arm or two behind, tied behind their back if you don't because of the revenue possibilities. But it's just not easy because of the history, the politics, all the different things in Italy. So if if you're buying in, you got to know the situation. I would assume that they do after everything that Rocco Camiso has said about the situation. Um, but the club's in a good position. They're in a much better position than they were when Rocco bought in. So keep an eye on it. He has said they're not for sale. They just did a new extension with the manager for an extended period of time. So he says they're not for sale. Wouldn't be the first time that somebody says it's not for sale, but that it's really for sale. So keep an eye on it. Uh, really curious to see where that goes. Really curious to see what, what happens in Rosario Central with Carlos Tevez, who is the new manager of Rosario Central. I guess he has his badges. Um, he hasn't been out of the game very long as a player. He has no coaching experience. Um, not the first time this sort of things happen in Argentina, but he officially retired as a player 17 days ago. He has not been an active player for a, close to a year around that after he left Boca. Uh, he was asked about signing Angel Di Maria, who is a former Rosario Central uh, developed player. And Tevez is like, I can't talk about this. I barely speak to my wife due to the amount of work I have. I would like him to come. Who wouldn't? When the situation calms down, I will call him and ask him what he wants to do. We know what he's like. It'd be very positive for the squad, for the experience he would bring to the guys. He's going to have opportunities in Europe. Demary is not coming yet. Um, Tevez did single out his time with Antonio Conte and how much he learned from him. He only spent a year with him at Juventus, uh, singled him out for special praise. He said, Conte is my model, taught me a lot at Juventus. I will try to make my team play a little, even half as well as his team's play. Um, Tevez is an interesting one because he's got that time, obviously, in the Argentine game and legend with the national team, one of the greatest players Argentina has ever produced, legend with Boca, played in Brazil, went to England and played for West Ham, played for Manchester United, played for Manchester City, but he also spent that time in Italy. So he's got a well-rounded playing time, Jarrett. He's got a lot of different people, whether it's Conte, who he mentioned. He played for Mancini, he played for Sir Alex Ferguson. He's played for some of the greatest managers you can find. What he is as a manager, we have no idea yet, but it's definitely uh, going to be one to watch, and I'm sure there will be lots of talk about it in our I would imagine so. Um, it should be interesting to see you know, how we see so many of these guys come through who can be tactically brilliant about it, but can be kind of hard-nosed about the man management side of things because I think it's different managing a group of players, even a group of players you might know, than it is being a part of it, being a part of the team. Even if you're a leader of that team, it's different when you're a manager. We'll see you know, how how he goes about it. You know, Is it more carrot, more stick? How do the guys react to it? Um, it's, it's, it's Argentina, it's not the U.S., so I mean – you're not probably going to hear about it the same way we've heard about stuff like Losada here or uh, Gabriel Heinze here. It's it's a different animal, and people 
you know, approach things differently. They accept things differently. They're okay with, you know, that more kind of heavy handed approach, I guess, with younger players, but you're going to automatically, you've got a guy who's, you know, a legend who's managing your club. That's a hell of a recruitment tool, especially if you got young players in the area and you're trying to keep them from going to a bigger club as young players might not be a bad idea to reach out to them and say, Hey, look, who's managing us now. Remember watching him on TV? On the World Cup, he'll manage you now, make you good. Yeah, I, I, I do want to say there, there's zero to indicate that he's going to be like a Gabriel Heinze or an Aaron Lasada. Like, there's zero to indicate from his personality that he's going to be that kind of a manager. I, I actually wouldn't really think he would be just based off his personality. You know, he was a, a hard nosed player, but he's also an attacker. And he was also somebody who, you know, had the flair and, celebrated that style of it um i and and we don't know tactically what he'll do like i i don't i don't get the sense he's gonna be like those guys um we, we'll find out because there's literally nothing to compare it to right now but the stature you know i look at it a little bit more like maradona and, and look at his time at Amnasia where you know tactically you weren't talking about maradona with tactics you were talking about players being motivated to play for him. And I think you'll see that at Rosario Central. I think you will you might see a younger player stick around an extra year as opposed to making a move to one of the bigger clubs. Although, and, and Tevez said it, and I, I agree, Rosario Central has all the pieces in place to be one of the top clubs in, in Argentina. Um, the, the There's only two, cl- two major clubs in Rosario, Newell's Old Boys and Rosario Central. Uh, they've got a huge stadium. They've got a huge infrastructure. They've got a huge fan base. He, he called him a sleeping giant. I agree. He could be the one that puts it over. Like they're a much bigger club than Ignacio, where Maradona was at last, for example. But I think you're going to initially, I'm looking at who is he going to have on his staff? How are they going to divide up the duties? I would think that the man management would be strong from him and, and the individual, you know, conversations with, I mean, if you're a young forward and, you got Carlos Tevez telling you, hey, when I played and I was in the 18, I looked at these things in the goalkeeper. I looked to play it you know, across their body and go far post. Uh, but, you know, if they did this, if their movement leaned this way, I'd go near post. Like you get that conversation. If you're a young forward, you're a 14, 15, 16 year old kid coming up and Tevez sits you down and goes through that kind of conversation. Good grief. You know, what does Tevez do with the defenders? What what kind of tactics does he want to play? How does he feel the game? Does he want them to, to have the ball? I would assume yes. Does he want them to press when they don't have the ball? Very possibly. Um, does he want to play out of a 4-3-3? Does he, how does he want them to defend? You know, he mentions Conte. That's interesting to me because like his time in Italy gives him maybe a little bit different feel for the game than, than some of these other guys. Where does it, you know, look like? Does he out of the Argentines? Is he uh you know, a Bielsa guy, does he believe in the things that Bielsa brought to the table? Um, does he, you know, lean more to a, a Bilardo of win at all costs, whatever it takes, be pragmatic if you got to be? Does he lean more to a, a Minotti, a, you know, idealism? It's no, this is the way we have to play. This is the way we feel the game. These are the things that we just don't know yet. You know, we've seen Heinze's initial foray into management good, and then it didn't work here in Atlanta. We've seen Gago initially. It didn't go well at Aldo City, a very a smaller club. It's been pretty good at Rossing, um, and Gago's one of the biggest names, and it's been pretty good. But they've had some big losses that have popped up. So how will Tevez handle those moments? So many different aspects to it. It's fascinating when you see a guy basically, and there's about a year gap here, walk off the field and become a manager because you just don't know what he turns into. But he's got a lot to give the game, and we'll find out. It's going to be a, a watch. So if you're you're watching on Paramount Plus, you're watching on Fanatis, Rosario Central, yeah, somebody you probably want to tune into right now and, and see what they look like. Uh, U.S. Men's National Team, couple of friendlies announced yesterday: Japan and Saudi Arabia. I do not understand why they're playing Saudi Arabia. Um, the political connotations of this, uh, I cannot imagine, look good. I can't imagine there's not going to be uh, conversations had about that. I don't think you get a ton out of it from a soccer perspective, unless you feel like they are going to play exactly like Iran. I 
you know, they, they only lost one game in 18 in World Cup qualifying. Sure, they haven't played anybody outside of their region in a long time. Uh, they haven't historically been a, a top opponent. Um, I don't think it's worth it because they're going to get criticized for booking that game. I don't think it's worth it. I can't imagine you, you didn't have a better opportunity than that one. Japan, September 23rd. We don't know where that's going to be played. I like that one. My um, soul was ready for that. Yeah, I like that one. I mean, are they are they going to play like Wales or England or Iran? No, not really. But you're not in a position to where you can book this the same way that you've wanted to because it's it's not like you can play three games simulating a group stage and booking whoever you want to book that plays kind of like the teams you're going to play. You don't have that luxury. You get two games, and the European teams are all booked up. So they're playing Nations League. This is what you get. Had to be a better opponent than Saudi Arabia on the board, though. There did. Japan, at least you're getting a getting team good traditionally opponent. very technical. Yep. Um, get, getting more athletic, I think, as time goes on. Um, yep. And more problematic to deal with on the field. But, yeah, Saudi Arabia doesn't make any sense. Y'all, could, y'all couldn't find something better, and that's it's, – it's just weird. Because, yeah, like you said, I mean, it's – you get past the entire – issue of you know on the field i don't even know what to expect from saudi arabia on the field is it worth a headache for you really because you're gonna have to answer some questions you probably don't want to have to answer and you're only going to answer them because you chose to play saudi arabia in a friendly and you knew the questions would come yes like that that's the part is it's not like something happens and it's like oh well we didn't know this was going to happen and so when they get busy and they don't want to answer questions and their answers get short i I zero sympathy because you have you have made the nest next to the badger's den. Yeah, Don't be mad imagine. when the badger comes out. Can't imagine it's going to be quiet as we get closer to that game. Yeah. Um, that's September 27th. Japan will be on September 23rd. We know the Saudi Arabia match will be in Spain. Brian Reynolds is officially going on loan from Roma to Westerlo of Belgium. Um, they won the second tier to move back up to the top flight for the first time since 2017. He will get to play. Does that maybe give him an opportunity, a very outside opportunity to get into the national team picture for the world cup? Yes. Um, but he he was never going to play at Roma crazy deal for him to go from Dallas to Roma for 8.5 million. It never made any sense at the time. I didn't think he was ready for it. You bring in Jose Mourinho eventually at Roma. He had no time for him. Didn't care. Just he's got to go play. Hopefully, he can get his confidence back, and and we'll find out if that's in Belgium with a team that just got promoted. Uh, some other rumors on the board, and there are a few. Francisco Calvo of San Jose could be headed to Turkey. Uh, Konyaspor's name has come up, uh, according to Fabrizio Romano. Some are, or, or, or a few European clubs have asked for what it would take to bring in Francisco Calvo, who will be playing at the World Cup with Costa Rica. Uh, some other non MLS ones Robert Lewandowski, um, according to Sky Germany, still wants to leave, although the German club is saying he's not leaving. Um, Matteo Moretto says that Barcelona thought Bayern would, would back off a little bit, they are not. They have no intention at this point of accepting any transfer bid for Robert Lewandowski. That's going to get ugly. I got a bad feeling, and I don't know how ugly Bayern Munich wants it to get or will allow it to get. They should just do a deal. But when will they? I don't know. Just got a bad feeling that's going to be a nasty one. Uh, Raheem Sterling, he has been linked with Real Madrid. They've stepped up their interest in recent weeks. Barcelona, Chelsea, everybody else you can possibly imagine is interested in Raheem Sterling. Chelsea have moved more down that road since Usman Dembele doesn't look like he's going to go to Chelsea. PSG and Bayern have stepped up their interest in Dembele. Chelsea have kind of pushed away from that one, and they're looking more at Raheem Sterling. Fabian Ruiz of Napoli, he's got one more year on his deal. Arsenal and Newcastle are interested in bringing him in, according to Italian reports. Uh, Sebastian Aller is going to Dortmund. He's going to be the Erling Holland replacement. Axel Witzel headed to Atleti, it sounds like right now. Um, feels like a very Atleti kind of move. 33 years old, 
a veteran, a rock in the midfield. He fits what Simeone is going to want. Everything seems to check off the boxes there. Wolves, uh, getting a little more aggressive, Wolves. They're linked with two players from South America, Enzo Fernandez from River, who we've talked about a lot. It's going to be a release clause of about 20 million euro or dollars, depending on who you talk to. Very manageable. He's worth it right now with what he's done over the last couple of years, first for Defensa Justicia and then for River. Gabby Goal is also linked with a move to Wolves from Flamingo. Now, he's been in Europe before. It didn't work out well. He's done great at Flamingo. Are they ready for him? Well, now that they're not playing caveman ball like they used to under previous management, maybe so. Um, Wolves could be an interesting team to pay attention to, depending on how aggressive they get and if they get these kind of moves. Uh, They're not linked to Alfredo Morelos, but uh, a lot of people are because Rangers, they got one more year with him under contract, Jarrett. And right now they haven't been able to get a new deal done. So you would think that they would sell him this summer if they can't get a new deal done. I would think so. Um, get something for him at least, because our Buffalo was uh, Buffalo was really damn good. And honestly, the thing that surprised me most about that run to the Europa League final was the fact that they did it without him, because Joe Arriba was able to do that job up top and some scoring in the Europa League final before they could lose in penalties. But Morelos is is a certified crazy person, first of all. Um, certified <laughs> yeah he is a genuine a1 crazy human being uh, I think one of the most impressive things that was done at Rangers during Steven Gerrard's time was he he, he he or somebody on that staff took all of that crazy and managed to harness it in a positive direction I'm endlessly impressed that they were able to do so because he has an insane amount of talent um you know Colombian he's been on Colombia national team call-ups He's incredibly physical as a hold-up nine if you need him to be, uh, sometimes a little too physical. Those arms can get a little extended. Those elbows can get a little pointy. But he's also very good with give him that half chance in front of goal. He'll make stuff happen. I think he would be fine on the continent. Uh, honestly, I think he'd be fine in England depending on the team you put him in. He sure as hell can handle the physical side of England. Um I would be very interested to see him go there because he's very fun to root against when he's going against your team, but he kind of has a little Dom Dwyer in him, in my opinion. Oh, he I, does. I think if he's on your team, you'll go to bat for it. Absolutely. You, you're going to get in the, you won't get in the comment sections in his defense, but when he's against your team, he's infuriating to play against. Cause yeah, he's going to, he's, he's, he's very easy to get under his skin and he wants to get under your skin as well. So it's, it's always entertaining. Now, how does Rangers fill that void? I don't know if Ariba was that guy going forward because one of the issues they ran into late in the season when they played Celtic was if they didn't have – if Ariba wasn't able to provide that physical hold-up play, they didn't have a nine who could hold up physically against guys like Cameron Carter-Vickers or Carl Starfeld. Yeah, curious to see where that goes. Um, I think they got to do something, bring something in for him. So we'll see how they then reload after that. Uh, Calvin Phillips, no bids yet, according to Graham Smith. Leads are only going to bring somebody else in, like Tyler Adams, if Calvin Phillips goes. And no official bids as of yet. Uh, also, no bid in the uh, reports that we talked about on Monday of Evan Nielsen, who is at Porto, and there were rumors of a 70 million euro proposal turned down. It made no sense. A 55 million pound deal that would have been their highest ever that was turned down that made no sense. Fabrizio Romano says it makes no sense. He's not on Manchester United's list as of today. They've talked about Anthony. They have not talked about Evan Nielsen. Um, there is there was no bid and nothing happened with that despite the rumors. Welcome to silly season. It's silly. Uh, one more, and we, we mentioned it earlier about the growth and investment in Liga MX Feminil. Uh, Pachuca, who is not a club that has been among the top top in Liga MX Feminil, they have added Barcelona player uh, Jennifer Hermoso, who is a Spanish national team player as well, a very highly thought of player, going to Pachuca. That's a big deal. Um, you're going to see more of these kinds of things. And it's really interesting, the investment levels coming up with, with Liga MX Feminil. Uh, I just retweeted it. The uh, Women's Cup, which is a big tournament coming to the States this year. Talked to 
uh, JP Reynal, who's doing the Daytona Soccer Fest and is also involved in the Women's Cup in Louisville. You've got OL Rain, you've got Racing Louisville, you've got Tottenham coming to that, you've got Milan, um, you have Japan represented, but you also have Club America represented. And one of the things talking offline with, with JP and some others is how is Club America going to compare not just to the NWSL teams, but to a Milan, to a Tottenham? How are they going to hold up in that? That's going to be really interesting to see and potential game changer with, with Liga MX Feminil getting more aggressive and adding players. Is and this, I think, would be my last one because I know I'm, I'm running out of time and we're hitting the end of the show. Yep, we um, are hitting the end of the show. <clears throat> uh, I do want to point out there was a really good article in The Athletic about uh, and this it, it, it goes to my beloved Celtic, but I'm hoping to see more countries do this of expanding their horizons about where they're going. There's a good article about, you know, Celtics moving their recruitment more towards South America and the, talking a little bit about the biases that people have about South American players over in Europe, whether it is, you know, the Brazilian, the bias of Brazilian versus Argentine versus Ecuadorian versus Paraguayan, whatever it might be. And then how people, you know, were trying to work through those biases and basically getting some of these mid tier. I mean, do we want to call it like the power five and cross and cross the streams here of like England, Spain, France, power Germany, five, I mean, big five, Italy. whatever. That's what yeah. Call it. yeah. Yeah. Getting beyond that big five, getting to the leagues at that next level that are starting to tap more into what MLS has found, which is you can find some insanely good players and insanely good values in South America outside of, you know, just, you know, somebody who just happens to be playing in Brazil. Um, but Celtics done that. They've, uh, we were talking about a uh, Bernabe is coming from Lanus. Mm-hmm. Um, they're also looking to bring in uh, Venetia Souza, who uh, was a Brazilian player who was in, on loan in Belgium. I mean, Hopefully more of them will start doing that to go and look at not just, hey, let's go look at this one Brazilian guy. Let's go look at this one guy who's playing at River or Boca. But hopefully they've seen what's happened in MLS and will expand their scouting to those other areas of South America and drop some of their biases they might have about it. More competition and all of it gets really, really interesting. Uh, last rumor that is popping up out of Spain is that Sergio Ruiz, who uh, has played with Las Palmas in the past, could be headed back to Las Palmas from Charlotte. Um, hasn't played a ton with, with Charlotte this year. And uh, he had some issues before he came to Charlotte. Maybe getting back to Spain would be more comfortable for him. And he was also somebody that Miguel Angel Ramirez wanted to bring in and maybe things have changed a little bit with the change in staff there. So uh, keep an eye on some outgoings maybe from Charlotte here in this window. We talked about it when Ramirez was let go, that you might see some players who liked working under him, maybe don't want to work under the new leadership and maybe are frustrated that he's gone and we'll see what happens. Jarrett, we'll talk to you tomorrow, correct? That sounds like a plan. Let's do it. Okay. We'll talk to you then. See ya. Uh, John, give me three questions from the Twitch pitch before we go. Well, actually, uh, let me give you a couple of news and notes before I head to the Twitch pitch real quick. Just some quick bullet points. Okay. Uh, Leeds has turned down the first uh, the new offer from Arsenal for Rafinha. They don't want to stand in Rafinha's way, but they want to make it worth their own while. Reportedly, it was a low offer, and Arsenal knew it was a low offer, which is kind of dumb as to why you did it in the first place. Sadio Mane is now official with uh, Bayern joining Liver- uh, for a deal worth 41 million euro, pretty much what Liverpool paid for him back in 2016. Two offers previously rejected. This one goes through at 41 million euro. Todd Boley confirmed as Chelsea chair and interim sporting director as the club have their new board out. Marina Granovskaya's departure is immediate, but she remains, quote, available, end quote, for the duration of the transfer window. And uh, quickly, you mentioned Carlos Tevez and uh, Rosario Central right now, 23rd in the table of 28. The first Four games, in, yeah. Uh, one, one, and two. They the one goal that they scored this season was in the win, the one nil win. Their first match with Carlos Tevez is against Hymnasia on Friday, so that will be an interesting watch. And you mentioned Fiorentina and uh, Rocco Camiso. He bought them for 160 million euro back in 2019. So three years later, he could possibly double his initial investment. Yeah, he says it's not for sale, but the reports are three hundred fifty million or what's being offered, and you, you know, almost you double it plus getting close to tripling it. That's gonna be hard to say no to if you're so frustrated with everything going on. So who knows? We'll see. 
the uh, initial uh, discussion that we had in the first half hour about uh, Women's World Cup, and we were mm -hmm. talking tickets and availabilities. Bart said, I always talk about how I bought a ticket package for Montpellier in 2019 for $12.50 a ticket. My tickets for the USA matches were $25. I hope that the 2027 tournament can show that FIFA can charge normal event money for tickets and still sell a lot of tickets. It's good to have accessible price points, but that makes the event feel cheap. It does. And that was a big talking point out of 2019 in France. The tickets were incredibly cheap. Um, but I think you have to go for it here. I think the perception, if you play in smaller venues, would be bad. And we're, we're seeing it with the Euros uh, this summer that the people are already talking about the negative perception. And if that means you got to work harder at selling tickets, well, you need to get good people selling tickets. And if you need to figure out ways to create packages or do some community things, those kinds, that's, that's a definite, you do that. But you, if, if you're buying a package of tickets at a venue for 12 bucks, you don't feel like that has a whole lot of meaning. And you do have to find those price points. We talked about it with Charlotte coming into MLS. Everybody, you know, blew up about PSLs and it's going to be super expensive. This and that they've sold tickets and they've, done everything they said they would do in regards to tickets and that has set an expectation that this is not a minor league event this is a major league event um that's the reality of it because that factors in too i, I wish i could buy tickets to everything i want to buy tickets for you know for five bucks a piece but also you know if you're a band and and you've grown to a point that you can charge more for your time and it's worth more than yeah, by all means, you know, you're going to find that number. If people don't buy your tickets at a, a high price, then maybe you're not quite as valuable as you thought you were. But you can't come in and sell stuff for five bucks a piece either and expect it to be seen as valuable. It's it's a it's a balancing act. That's what all this is. Then in our discussion about markets 31 and 32, should MLS decide to go that way? Uh, just looking at the owner and not necessarily market size. Uh, Michael Head, isn't there some sort of bonus for added subscribers to Apple? Wouldn't that be more possible in larger markets versus an Albuquerque or a Boise? Maybe, maybe not. Um, are you going to get people in Detroit or San Diego um, to be interested in the same numbers as you could in a smaller market with their own team? I don't think it's a guarantee that just because numbers are there that it's going to be better because we're not seeing that in the league that the larger markets are drawing the largest crowds consistently. So I, I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think if you, you know, cause we're dealing with a different set of, of, of kind of numbers here we're working with. If you get, let's say it's Boise, let's just use that as a, as an example. And Boise, let's say somebody comes in and, and is willing to plump down, you know, $600 million to bring a team to Boise and they're going to build a $500 million stadium and they're, they've, they're loaded and they, they made their money in the potato world. I don't know. And they want to do this for Boise. Okay. If they then create a buzz in Boise and Boise sells 30,000 season tickets and has a waiting list of another 20,000 and has the interest level in the market of uh, 250,000 that want to make sure they can watch these games. And you go to San Diego and maybe you don't get that same level of interest. You know, the, the thing here now that changes it is you can build the interest anywhere. Michael's coming at it a little bit more from the old school way of TV ratings, where the idea with putting a team in a market was based off the market size, according to the TV market and the TV ratings and what that could potentially do. This takes that need out and it's well can i sell more tickets and and more memberships in boise than i can in san diego it takes the tv market side of it out of it and i think in mls history we have seen at times great response from columbus ohio which was not expected to be one of the big markets in the league they became one straight away they sold more season ticket deposits than anybody else coming into 1996 that's why they got a team We've seen the response in Austin. We've seen the response in Charlotte. We've seen the response in Cincinnati. Uh, we've seen it in St. Paul. You know, we, we we're seeing it in these places. We haven't seen it as much in Miami. And Miami's a bigger market. 
So it's more about what you do in your market now than ever before than purely the size of the market. And I like that. I think that means you're going to have better teams that come in. So let me go with Burn and Bart since it's the same topic really quickly. Burn okay. says the problem in a smaller market is that you earn less corporate sponsorship dollars, which is you a can. big part of soccer revenue for clubs worldwide, around 25% in Germany. You can't. Of course you can't. Look, guys, I mean, we can we can do this game all day where like anything that gets said, there's a counter to it because there is like we know that this is you're, you're measuring. Can I get more interest in a smaller market? Can I get can can Boise or somebody like that get more market penetration than you would in a bigger market? You might not have as many big companies that are willing to sponsor there but you might get more of the companies willing to sponsor there and you might make the same amount of money. You don't know either way. You can't tell me that, you know, San Diego is going to be a better market than somebody else. You can't tell me that because they haven't been able to pull it together up to now. Have they, you know, you can't tell me that Sacramento is going to be perfect. They haven't been able to get the ownership, right? You can't tell me. And I can't tell you that Boise is going to be perfect because I don't know who would buy in the hypothetical situation. We can play the counter game all day. And, and I hope that we get the what I hope that we do here is that we get the level of conversation up to we're not just giving you a hot take. I'm not sitting here telling you Boise will be the greatest market in the history of MLS. Book it. No, we're talking through the possibilities of it. And the new MLS deal opens those possibilities to some different things. Is it the right way, the wrong way? Depends on the owner. Because if somebody walks in and is willing to invest at a level that is higher than somebody is willing to invest in a bigger market with the way MLS's history is gone and the way this deal is set up, I'm taking the more committed owner. I don't need to be in the bigger city just because it's a bigger city. I'm taking the most in the most interested, the most committed owner. And I think the league would be better off for it, but we don't know who that is just yet. So we're all playing the hypothetical game right now, but yeah, guys, I hope that we understand this because when, when we have these conversations, when we talk about possibilities, we're trying to help the understanding of all the different possibilities as opposed to, doing the sports talk radio thing that so many do. And I, and look, it's easy to play. I don't like to play that game. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Boise is a slam dunk or Louisville would be a slam dunk. They would have to do things and bridge the gap that maybe an advantage of San Diego would have. But I don't think San Diego is a slam dunk either because the others could be able to bridge that gap and do better. That's what we're talking about. So we're giving you possibilities. We're talking through it. It's not a right or wrong situation. Just because there's more sponsorship possibilities in a San Diego or a Phoenix doesn't mean you get them. Just because there's more people who might watch a game in New York doesn't mean they're going to watch. So that's also the possibility. So we're talking through what goes into the decision-making process. And it's all scale. You know, I mean, if... For me, the number one thing on that scale is the quality of ownership. Because I don't want a bad owner in a bigger city just because it's a bigger city. I want the best committed owners who want to be in the markets that they're in. That's what I want. And honestly, I think Austin is showing why that's the route. Because Precourt did not want to be in Columbus. He took one for the team and bought a team that nobody else wanted to buy that team. He did. He tried to make it work. Did he leave in a bad way? Absolutely, he did. Did he handle that badly? Absolutely, he did. No question about it. But do you want him and the group that he's put together in Austin in the league? Yes, you do. They're good for the league. And Columbus worked out better because you got people who wanted to be in Columbus. Great. The league benefited from that. But it all came down to committed ownership where they wanted to grow their team in their market as opposed to, well, the market research tells me that this market's bigger than the other, but we'd have to take a lesser owner. 
Give me the better owner every single time. Give me the more committed owner every single time. That's the number one thing for me. Then the last one from Bart, he says, I've been talking about the change in measuring audience from a college football standpoint for a while. A lot of conferences made moves for market size, Mm -hmm. but failed to look for healthy fan bases or alumni bases. Now they have to look at those schools who support their teams and will pay for subscriptions, not just teams with a TV market, yells in WBU fan. So many. I mean, it's just market size doesn't make everything work. It doesn't. And I think you've seen a lot of bad moves made in sports just purely because of a market size. You know, college is a different conversation. This is where you're inviting somebody to join the club. I want good people joining my club, not good markets joining my club. Markets aren't necessarily real because you might not fully capitalize on that market. I want good people in that room who are going to make the league better. I want good people in my board of governors meeting who are going to make the league better. That's that's what makes the league better, in my opinion, not a TV market that you're not hitting right now. That's bigger than another one. It's just it, it to me that doesn't. And I think this deal makes it a lot easier for you to make those decisions because you're not looking at TV ratings the same way you used to. TV ratings don't mean anything for MLS anymore. It's nice when you get them. Don't get me wrong. You want people to watch, of course. But you want people to subscribe. Now with the Apple deal, you're looking for subscribers and they might watch only their team's games. Okay. Did they pay their money? Yes. Are they a subscriber? Yes. Cool. Now I got to sell them and watch any other stuff. And like we said before, now you're, you're getting away from, well, I got to put Los Angeles on and I got to talk about Los Angeles because I got to get people to watch the Los Angeles game because Los Angeles is the biggest market. I got to have them on. Now, if the best story is, you know, Houston or Austin or Kansas City or Colorado or whoever, and it's appealing to people and people are invested. Cool. I can talk about that just the same way. This is a good thing for the league. It opens up so many doors as to getting into the market size game to me. And I think that applies to expansion as well. But that's just where I think it can go. The individual places comparing them straight place to place and what sponsorship could be doesn't matter to me. It's it's I got to have the right ownership. And and that's what it comes down to. So we'll see. We'll see where it goes. But yeah, I mean, just in general, like there are very rarely, I know we we use the term a lot and it, it gets brought up. There are very rarely slam dunk deals in any of this. You can have the right person that you think could come in and be the right owner for this team. And this can go into Europe as well. And it doesn't work. And things change. And, you know, all the things on paper don't make it Makes sense. PSG should have won the Champions League by now. They haven't. They should have. They haven't. You know, there's no guarantees. So, you know, just when when we get into these conversations, just remember, you know, all the different factors and everything that goes into it, and we see what happens. That's the fun of this. You never know. If a big investor comes in and wants to put a team somewhere that surprises us, man, if they're the right person, I want them in. And we'll see if that's the way the league goes. There's no guarantee that they do. Maybe you have people in the league who are making these decisions who say, I just want a big market. Okay. I hope they've learned that maybe that's not necessarily the route to success where it used to be. But we'll find out and we'll see where it goes. Um, I think there's enough sponsorship money out there. I think there's enough potential subscribers to the Apple TV deal. I think all those things are in place to where you can be in a lot more places than have previously be con- been considered. I think you can, and we'll see where it goes. And this worldwide nature of it. Hey, you want to, you want to get, you know, go a step further. If you put a team in Boise, the worldwide nature of this Apple deal, you're not necessarily limited to Boise businesses and sponsors. You might be looking at others, you know, yeah, you might have a harder time selling your, corner kick sponsor on your local radio broadcast. It might be a different narrative than it would be in a, in a bigger market. Okay. That's not going to affect the bottom line in a dramatic way. But if you're trying to get into the league or you're trying to get into the United States or literally, if you're just trying to advertise something worldwide with the nature of this. Now you might say, well, Hey, I can get into Boise for less than I could get into the New York team. Um, I am a, international conglomerate and i will pay to be on the front of that shirt because we've seen that in european clubs too by the way so who knows 
anything is possible if you start to get out of these boxes that I think we've all lived in with the, with the game at times. Just keep possibility in mind. And I'm not I'm not giving you hot takes about Boise. Trust me. The right person has to come in and want to make Boise happen for Boise to be a good deal. That's what it comes down to. But if they want to make that work and they're committed enough to do it and they got the resources to do it, I'd be willing to bet on that than a lesser owner in a bigger market. That's the thing that I will make my hot take on. And I mean, if you're if you if you are a business looking to grow one of these a growth opportunity wherever you want to try to expand Mm -hmm. and you're looking at this apple deal and you have all of these clubs that you can sit there and to your point if i can give my company added exposure in the mls deal in apple and if i can sit there and say okay i think i'll do it in Louisville, Boise, wherever, you can get more exposure for what you're doing, I think, when it comes to the dollar ratios. I think that you can sit there and sense and seize an opportunity to grow your business in a lesser in a lesser market size just because of everyone's attracted to the larger cities and the larger clubs and all these kinds of names. You really can make a name for yourself by investing in a growth opportunity, which I think that you could see a lot of these companies do by looking in those smaller market clubs under this deal where you're just looking for subscribers and the subscriber sits there and they're watching this match in a, in a smaller market. And it's like, oh, okay, you're giving yourself recognition in a place that you wouldn't have normally thought to do so. I think it, I think it opens a lot of doors that wouldn't necessarily have been there if you were looking under traditional television opportunities like we've seen in the past. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I was saying. Like, I, I think this is an international broadcast deal um, and it's all under the same umbrella and it just it changes it. It just changes it. So uh, we'll see. We'll see if that's how the league feels or, or what they're going to do. I mean, they haven't even got number 30 announced yet. So well, uh, slow down. we got to get that nailed down with Vegas if they're the ones. And then you, you go from there and you figure out what's coming after that. I think they'll go to two more. I think they'll get to 32, and then they'll see where they're at before they make a bigger change to the league, which would be expanded beyond 32. I don't know what that timeline would be or if they do it or if it makes sense to do it. We'll just have to wait and see. That'll do it for us. You got stoppage time today at 2 o'clock. Uh, I'll be on the midday show on 92.9 The Game at 1.20, talking to Andy and Randy. Um, I will also be on the UPSL Georgia final tonight. Uh, Atlanta United's U19 did, or academy team, because it wasn't purely a U19 team. They lost in the semifinal. KSA Pro Profile is back to try to defend their crown. Um, you also have Georgia Football Club, which is a new team in the league, or at least a new team getting to this stage of the league. So uh, two upsets in the semifinals. The two teams that had to go through the first round made it to the final. That'll be on 11 Sports. Uh, my friends over at Atlantic Soccer Media. Uh, but 11 Sports, you can look up UPSL Georgia. That final's at 7.30. It'll be over at the Children's Health Care of Atlanta Training Ground. So busy rest of the day. We'll be back in the morning to get you set for everything going on because I am sure we will hear more rumors. We will hear more innuendo. There will probably be some deals that get finalized. All the chaos that happens in the soccer world in the summer. We'll be talking about it tomorrow morning. So until then, much platio. Much platio.